Hey guys, what's going on? This is Benjamin with Benjamin Exotic. I just want the straight up answer. They would combat. That's exactly what they do. I'd throw them in there. This guy would feel like his space would be, was being invaded. They'd go up, probably take him a few minutes to get to that stage, but then they'd start, you know, kind of pounding each other's bodies against each other. And they normally won't really bite and coil, but I have seen it happen before on YouTube from people trying it out, and it's really not a good situation. So if you're even considering it, I would tell you no, first of all, but you never, ever. Hi everybody, I'm Dave Kaufman. You ever wonder what it would be like to be at the beginning of Broward County, out west Broward, which was pretty much in the Everglades. And um, I started in reptiles at about seven years old, capturing local herps and selling them to pet stores. Uh, we're going all the way back to 1976 here. Uh, at that point, uh, there were no big captive breeding programs. We had some of our, our pioneers out there breeding corn snakes and things like that but everything sold in pet stores was actually wild caught. All of the exotics was imported in that was typically wild caught as well. So, you know, growing up, my, my grandfather owned two big Italian restaurants in Miami, would always ask me as a child, how are you gonna make a living playing with snakes? And I honestly didn't have an answer for him back then. And unfortunately he didn't live long enough to see Graziani reptiles come to fruition. Um, but it was just a passion of mine. And initially I did, I, I spent 21 years in law enforcement, law enforcement. And uh, I finally figured, that, figured out that I could make a living doing what I love. And quite frankly, if you ask my wife today, she does not believe that I work. Let's start off with uh, my favorite ball python. This is a shocker right here. This is the oldest ball python in my collection. This is a uh, wild import. She was captively hatched in Africa and uh, came over in May of 1991. And she is the mother of the very first captive hatched pastel jungles. She's uh, actually been producing 11 to 12 eggs over the last five years per clutch. And I think she's produced well over 200 babies for us. Uh, she was bred to the original pastel jungle male. And she gave us seven eggs. And at that time, we had no idea what uh, dominant mutations were in the ball python industry. That was the first one. In, in 1997 uh, was the year that we got seven out of seven pastels from this female bred to the original pastel male. You know, back in 1997, uh, there were only a handful of proven ball python mutations. As a matter of fact, that was the year that the snake keeper proved out the azanthic and Pete Call proved out the piebald. Prior to that, we had ghost, caramel albinos, and albinos. Um, and when we brought those first seven babies to Daytona, we had them for sale for $2,500 a piece, and nobody was interested. And then six months later, as they started, as the pastel started to color up, we sent some of these photographs to the snake keeper, Dan and Colette Sutherland, and they immediately said, we, we want those animals, we think there's something genetic going on with those guys. So they bought four of the seven uh, original pastels that we produced, and uh, a couple months later, we had proven them to be genetic by breeding him to this female and another one, and the price of males went up to $10,000. This is one of those original seven, the only one that I have left that I kept back. Um, she, is, she is from that original seven. Um, I know the brother to this actually started the pastel line over at Marcus Jane Ball Pythons uh, with Mark Mandic. He bought the brother, and uh, Kevin McCurley ended up with one, and the Sutherlands, uh, with four of them and this is uh, the last animal. So this is the uh, the family right here together. This is the mother on this end. We've got the uh, female which is the the only offspring left from that original seven clutch and then the father right there on the end. So the only reason I have these guys is for sentimental reasons because uh, unfortunately their value in the market is is not much but um, the, these three animals right here I don't think I could ever get rid of. They, they literally started off my, my whole ball python operation. We've got a lot of really cool things here, but um, let's jump right to one of the coolest ball pythons that we have ever produced here at Grazzani Reptiles. This is a leopard pastel highway, which means this animal has the leopard gene, the pastel gene, the yellow belly gene, and the gravel gene in it. 
and uh, the, the pattern, when these guys hatched out, they actually had a blue hue or tint to it. You can almost see that in the outline around the dark pattern. Uh, the first people to see it were actually floored to see a ball python with blue in it. So in the center, we've got the uh, leopard pastel highway. And then off to this side, the real light washed out animal. This animal's in shed, so it's typically a little bit brighter. This is the super pastel version of the larger animal in the center. And then over on the other side, we've got just a pastel highway with no leopard in it. The initial leopards um, came from Pete Call when he was producing out of his pied collection. What I think happened is when he was trying to make het pies, we were getting in all kinds of wild you know, females to breed to make his hets. And I think the leopard gene got, in brought, got brought in like that. Um, I had traded Pete a super pastel um, ball python for a piebald and a het pied. And what I ended up with was a leopard pied. 50% of the offspring were producing these het piebalds actually got leopards. And initially we were thinking that the trait was definitely connected to the pied gene because the leopard almost looked like a low white pied pattern. Um, but after a number of breedings, we've proven that the genes are separable. We do have super leopards that are not piebalds. Um, making the genes definitely separable. Yo, what up, Isaac? How you doing, brother? How the fuck you doing, brother? Super busy. Yeah, at work. Oh, I'm doing good, bro. Yeah, I'm hanging in there. Actually, I uh, just got back from PT, so haven't really started trading today. Uh, waiting for this setup right here. This is a bull flag pattern, dude. We dumped really hard yesterday. Well, not really hard, but we dumped like a couple hundred bucks yesterday. We're still trading in this uptrend here. So we'll see how she goes. We're already at the top of the range, so we might keep going up here. What's been happening, bro? Are you doing switches or something? Yo, I gotta show you what I just bought, dude. It's gonna be tight as fuck. Oh, say what up to Ben, dude. Tell him hi. Griffin Man 23. I was just watching this video where this guy is, he breeds pythons for a living and he's got some sick pythons, dude, and he sells them for like $10,000 a snake. Ridiculous, bro. 
striped animal. The other one is a possible hat piebald, but I don't believe it to be right, a hat because of the lack of striping. And I think that's something, Good luck. <laughs> again, it's just a theory. I've got to do a lot more breeding to actually prove this out. But I, I think the leopard gene is changed a little bit by the, the heterozygous piebald gene. So first we've got the leopard albino over here, which obviously you can see the leopard pattern in it, and it's a very high contrasted animal. And then on the outside, you've got an yeah, actual, got you, just no a worries. regular albino piebald. And then in the center, you've got the leopard albino piebald, and you can see how the leopard trait uh, as a dark trait just intensifies that orange. You know, the cinnamon story is, is kind of a cool one. This is the original cinnamon pastel that started the Graziani line. The, the year the uh, first seven pastels were produced in 1997 is, is the year we handpicked him out of Strictly Reptiles. I, I grew up right down the street from Strictly Reptiles. And what that meant was before most people were into ball pythons, there were a select few of us uh, that were going through shipments and pulling out odd colored ball pythons before anybody cared about them. And knowing what we know now, I, I can't tell you how many mutations slipped through my fingers that I didn't think would turn out to be anything. But this cinnamon gene was one that uh, I picked out from Strictly. And uh, it was just a different colored ball python from everything else in the group. And I picked out a couple of other what we called coffee or cinnamon colored ball pythons at the same time, and those animals never proved out. But uh, we, we stuck with this one male and uh, produced it, and, and there were some similarities that it had that the pastels had, and one of it was the solid white uh, belly. It didn't have any flecking on the belly, which was uh, like the pastels. So being that the, the pastel had worked so well, uh, marketing-wise, we initially called this a cinnamon pastel. And uh, that's one of the things with, with ball python history, new people don't realize, spider ball pythons were spider webbed. We had things got dropped, lessers or lesser platinums. Um, and, and this was a cinnamon pastel. Um, and and it, it proved out and, and turned out to be a, another great mutation to mix in um, with other things. And, and then when we produced the super cinnamons, which were a, a solid dark brown or black colored animal, um, things got even better. The problem came in with the naming of this animal was when I bred a cinnamon and a pastel together, we had already called this a cinnamon pastel, so the combination couldn't be a cinnamon pastel. Luckily, the animal that hatched out was pewter colored, so we called those pewters. The clown project is one that's, that's bugged me a little bit because I didn't believe that the clown was gonna be genetic. As a matter of fact, in Philippe de Vaugelet's book, the Barkers even have a photograph of it saying they don't believe it's going to be genetic. And I didn't get into that project till later. As a matter of fact, the snake keeper took those first pastels they got from me and bred them right to clowns and got to jump on that. This is uh, the first clown that uh, we ever got at our uh, facility here. And this is a VPI BHB line cross. I was really big in, in getting uh, uh, outbred animals if I could uh, to start things. So this was a really nice female that we picked up and over the years, um, she's a, a 2003 hatchling. She has produced quite a few offspring for us here. This is the future in our clown breeding project. And this animal right here is a super pastel leopard double het clown piebald male. So uh, his uh, sister is the uh, other half of the equation. But in the meantime, we've got him lined up with a bunch of clown females this year to produce all different combinations of leopard clowns. Pastel, super pastel, lesser cinnamons, pewters, all with the leopard gene in them. So right here, we've got the yellow belly pastel clown and just a pastel clown on the left over here. So you can see how much high contrasting the yellow belly has. It really accents and outlines that dark outline on the clown, bringing up a nice bright yellow color on that animal. We're gonna take a look at a number of ball pythons that I handpicked, uh, most of them through Strictly Reptiles over the years that just didn't prove out, but they're still incredible looking animals 
and, and, and I've kept them around. Most of them are females that have, that have produced pastels and other things. Um, this first animal here is what we named our velvet pastel because the black on this animal was velvet black. And as a hatchling, this animal was the same orange gold color as an albino with black pattern on it. And we were never ever able to actually replicate the coloration of this animal. And then this was the first ebony ball python, uh, actually photographed in, in VPI's ball python book. Um, and again, as a melanistic granite animal, we were never able to reproduce or prove this out as well. And there were a number of things going on. We thought this would be genetic. The striping, the coloration, the granite pattern on the side. Again, just another project that didn't prove out for us. This is a melanistic ball python. Um, and it, it has almost the identical color to the ebony. It doesn't have the granite sides, but it does have the same color. And this animal has produced a number of pastels and uh, other combinations for us. But as the animal has matured, it has grown this growth right here. And every time it sheds, the growth becomes kind of opened up. And it appears to be pure melanin. The closest thing I can describe it to is kind of a, a China wax marker. And it, it doesn't seem to be injuring or, or hampering the snake, but as the surface of that comes off, it is literally just black pigment. So I, I'd really like to get this animal to some type of, of uh, dermatologist or somebody that could kind of look at that and see what this kind of tumorous growth is that has all of this melanin in it. But we were unsuccessful in reproducing any type of melanistic ball python from this animal. Bred to pastels, they produce really, really pumpkiny orange pastels. And, and that's one of the things with ball pythons. Um, with the chromatophores, we don't even know at what level the color layers are and how many colors are actually in ball pythons. And that's uh, why we keep creating new and, and, and crazy color combinations because sometimes one gene opens up the key to something else and, and we just keep creating more and more and more. What's your opinion? Knowing what we know now, if you could go back to the beginning and work with any ball python morph, what would it be? Comment below and share your opinion. You know, one of the things that makes herpticulture so incredible, especially in this day and age, Hey, what's up you guys? Dave here for the Reptile Channel. So, about 10 years ago or so, I had just released a film called 13 Hours in a Warehouse, and for my next project, I really wanted to do a documentary, and one day I'm cleaning snake cages, and the idea for that documentary just hit me. Do a documentary on what it means to be a reptile fanatic, and from that idea, this movie was born. This is Herpers, and in this movie, the geckos and bearded dragons and baled chameleons and I was pretty well known for for those kind of animals and then in 2000 I started acquiring ball pythons and I really got bit with a ball python bug um, I ended up eventually transitioning most of my collection over to ball pythons uh, there just isn't enough time in the day to do all the geckos and chameleons and bearded dragons and everything and ball pythons so I was really interested in making all these different ball python color mutations uh, doing different combos and stuff so I decided to devote most of my time into the ball pythons and now that's almost exclusively what I do. I still have some geckos but uh, you know 95% of everything that I do now is ball python related. There are about 358 breeder females or holdbacks will hopefully be breeder females this year. I've got about 80 breeder males in this room and then I also have uh, probably about 340, give or take a few, uh, hatchlings and yearlings that I'm raising up to breed. So this this room is, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's there's a lot of snakes in here, and um, the, the room itself takes about uh, between 11 and 13 hours a week to take care of, to do all the feeding and watering and cleaning and everything. 
And uh, but yeah, this is where I, this room is where I house all of my my best stuff, my pet projects, like all my clown pies and like all the stuff that I really like a lot. And I'm the only one that that does all the maintenance in this room. I just want to make sure it's done exactly the way I want it. I'm I'm kind of picky about that. And uh, yeah, so I um, this is this is kind of my my room where I can just come and relax and just check out the snakes and I spend a lot of time down here I've got a TV on the wall I watch movies and stuff while I'm in here working on on my animals and uh, it's it's the most fun part of the business or at least the, of the the work that I have to do with the business is the days that I that I'm in here uh, just doing the watering and cleaning it's just therapeutic for me I get to actually really check out the snakes check out their health and just appreciate the colors and patterns most of the time I'm moving so quickly through my work day that I don't have time to actually appreciate how awesome some of these animals are so the day that I do my maintenance in here I actually get to look at all these animals and just appreciate them for what they are this rack right here is all there's 80 snakes in this rack and these are all almost all females there's a couple males in here too I think four in this whole rack um, but these are all female 2015s that are going to eventually go into my breeder racks. This rack here and two more racks just like it are all my 2016 holdbacks. So I went a little nuts in 2016. I just, you know, it was, it was so hard. I mean, I hatched out so many things that I just, I couldn't let them go. And I, you know, I started thinking like, well, if I keep this, I can hold it back and I can, I can breed to something else and I can make even better things and then I can hold those back and you know, I'm always thinking like two or three steps ahead in the process to make the perfect ball python and the problem with the perfect ball python is there's no such thing perfection is unique to each person and what they have in their mind's eye what they want to produce so I'm just trying to make a whole bunch of perfect ball pythons of all different colors and patterns and and um, so that's basically what I'm trying to do this is one of my favorite males this is a banana calico enchi. Calico and banana just go hand in hand so well, um, especially if you start throwing other genes in there. Like certain genes like enchi and yellow belly are really, really good to add into calico and banana. Yeah, that's basically what I'm trying to do is find, I'm doing a lot of experimental breeding here where I'm trying to figure out what are the best combinations that are gonna make the prettiest babies. All I wanna do, I don't even care necessarily what genes are in a specific animal, I just care that I'm making the absolute prettiest snake that I can. And so I'm just, I'm doing a lot of experimental breedings, like one year mixing certain things with calico, or next year mixing certain things with, you know, enchi or sugar or pastel or whatever the genes happen to be. Just trying different combinations to make different things. And if I like the result of it, I'll work on making more of those. If I, if I say, ah, oh, the result to start a new, definitely ready for next year. And uh, just another, Another way I can mix calico and banana in two different combinations of baby. So this one, I believe is, the well, I know it's the world's first and I think it's still uh, one of a kind. This is a super mystic lavender albino. Didn't really turn lavender, at least not yet. I bred a, a mystic lavender albino that I hatched out a couple years ago to a mystic possible hat lavender and produce this little guy here. Just the snakes in this room alone take me probably five hours to feed. I usually on Mondays I feed all the 2016s and then um, Tuesdays I feed all the 2015s and all the, the breeders. Yeah, they don't all get fed every week. Um, all the, the youngest ones do and like the, the ones that I want to get up to breeding size the quickest do. But a lot of the adults just don't need to get fed every week. You know, they get a good sized meal every other week um, and I feed them every week if I can. But like my breeder males at this time of year, I don't want to keep taking my males out of the breeding racks and into their own racks to feed them every week. It's just too disruptive to get all my, the females bred. So I only remove them every other week and then I feed them and then I put them back in with the females like two or three days later once they're kind of like partially digested a little bit. Um, almost all my males stay on feed all year long or at least all um, breeding season long. And ball pythons are kind of notorious for the males going off feed during the breeding season. I probably have, in this room alone, I probably have like 80 to 85 breeder males and probably you know 75 of those are eating rats really consistently i've got a few that are mouse eaters and then i even have a couple that go off feed for a couple months at a time but for the most part they just keep eating the whole year this is one of my favorite holdbacks from last year this is an orange dream fire yellow belly 100 percent het pie male uh, just a lot of cool combinations all in one snake and, and the fact that he's het pied even as a little ringer here. I have a coral glow bamboo woma, um, a little bit more subtle coloration but 
I think he might be going into shed right now. Pretty sure this is a world's first. Here's one of my favorites from last year. I know I say that a lot, but this one I really mean. This doesn't know what he wants to be. This, I believe, is a Paradox Pastel Clown Pied. It, it came from a, I think it came from my Pastel Clown Pied bred to a Pastel Possible Hat Clown Pied. This part here is obviously Super Pastel Pied. Uh, head is definitely not clown. But you have a little patch right there that's got some spotting in it that kind of reminds me of like a Pastel Clown. And then this part looks clown to me. So I'm pretty sure that's what that is, but either way, really crazy looking baby. It's just weird the way this, the striping is only on half of the body and it's not on this half too, but I just don't really know quite what to make out of this snake. Okay, this one is a sister of, of the uh, Paradox Pastel Clown Pie that I just had out. This one is a Paradox Pie that's possible hat clown. Look at the black on her. You don't see that with pied very often. I do see it occasionally, but not very often. And this one's got an, an emoji on it too. Look at that face. I think this was from, um, actually this is, they were from a pastel double hat clown pie bred to a pastel possible double hat clown pie. Okay, so these are my incubators. Um, I keep the temperatures ideally right at about 89 degrees. Sometimes they, they fluctuate a little bit. Um, you know, they're very tall incubators, so it might be you know, 88 in the bottom and 91 up on top. But for the most part, it's, you know, this one's showing 88 right in here right now. This one's showing 91 towards the top. Um, I probably should adjust that one to get a little bit cooler. But uh, basically I just put the, the eggs, um, I've got a layer of vermiculite in there. I completely saturate that with water. Then I put a light diffuser in there and set the eggs on that. That way the eggs aren't touching the vermiculite itself, but the humidity in there is very, very high. Um, I don't need to add any water to that because I only put a couple little like 1 16th inch drill bit holes in the, the sides. I put like one on each side, so there's four. Uh, that's enough for air exchange for the eggs. I sometimes use smaller pieces of the light diffuser if eggs are, um, are would otherwise touch the side of the container. Because when you get condensation on the container, whether it's on the top or on the sides, you don't want the eggs to touch that because they'll wick water in and it'll cause the eggs to die. And basically I just label them with what produced those eggs and wait 58 days and then the baby's hatched. Normally I'll cut the eggs open at like day 55 or 56, but as long as I can clearly feel the babies in there, I don't, I'll, I don't just randomly cut open eggs because you know, I don't just go by go by a certain day. I go by the feel of the eggs. Yo, um, what up? Eggs on the bottom venom. may take a couple days. How you doing, brother? Sorry, I'm watching some videos about snakes because uh, I got one. or even a week to incubate longer than the ones up at the top because it's a lot warmer up at the top. Warmer is going to make them uh, incubate quicker. So anyway, um, yeah, that's basically how I do it. And uh, I'm getting pretty full here. Within uh, two months, I'll probably have at least these two incubators completely full. I've got a third one there. Last year, um, I had all of these full basically for like six months straight. It was just insane. So every year I tell myself that I can't hold back so many babies. Um, I've been producing a lot of them for a long time. My last three years have been my three best years I've ever had. Um, 2014 I produced 2,200 babies, 2015 I produced 2,300, 2016 I produced something like 2,650. So every year I tell myself this is the year I'm going to sell everything I produce. I'm not going to hold much stuff back. Um, the problem is that once the babies start hatching and I see some of the stuff that comes out and it's just absolutely incredible and I just decide I can't sell this one, I can't sell this one, well I can fit one more baby hold back in there and I end up holding back like 200 babies every year, mostly females, but I probably hold back you know 50 to 60 males and probably 150 females every year. Okay, this is a nice little killer pied or super pastel pied that I hatched out. Had a few of these hatched this year, got some that are actually 100% hat clown. Uh, this one is not, but I always like to keep some of the firsts of anything new that I produce, even if they're not world's first, if they're just new for me. I like to keep, and this was the first super pastel pie or killer pie that I hatched out, so I decided probably should keep her. Never hurts to have more female pies in the collection. I've been holding back a lot of pies over the past couple of years. 
Uh, they're just so popular, I don't ever see that changing. So many different combinations that I want to do with them that I've just been holding a bunch of them back so that I have more breeding stock here to uh, experiment with. Okay, well, let's look at some dreamsicles. This is a female that I produced. I got this, uh, I, I produced my own double hats a few years ago. I bred a, a pied to a lavender. I got my double hats. Um, I actually ended up with four males and one female, which is almost the worst odds that I could get. I kept the one female, I kept one of the males. I bred those together uh, in 2015 and produced, I think there was one pied in the clutch and then a bunch of uh, normals. 2016, I did the same breeding again and I got not one, not two, but three dreamsicles in that clutch. And each egg had a one in 16 chance to produce these and I produced three of them out of seven eggs. So couldn't have been happier with that. Uh, two males and one female, I kept all three back. I always like to have a backup for every breeder male that I have. So decided that uh, two males would be a good idea there. And then the female, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with her. I'll probably breed her to like a clown pied or something and make quad heads. Or I guess they'd be pied, double head, uh, lavender clown, um, whatever. I mean, I'm sure I can find something fun to do with her. Okay, so this one that I want to show is a pastel clown pied male, and he is actually hopefully going to breed with this pastel double hat clown pied female. I hatched him out, I think it was in 2014, and uh, I hatched him out from a, a pair of pastel double hat clown pieds that I hatched out myself, so it's a, he's a second generation baby. Um, and he's breeding now. I actually got a couple clutches from him last year. And at the time when I hatched him, you know, he's obviously the only one that I've ever hatched. Uh, the chances of hitting on a pastel clown pied male in that clutch was only one in 32. It's a one in 16 chance to hit on the pastel clown pied, but then only a one in two chance to have it be a male. And I actually had somebody that really, really wanted to buy the snake from me very, very badly. And uh, uh, I was offered $12,000 for him and I turned it down. I thought about it at first. You know, twelve thousand dollars would be kind of nice to have that money to pay some bills, but then I thought, you know, I'd rather sacrifice short-term profits for long-term goal, and uh, my goal was to make more of them, and the best way to do that is to have a male. So I, I decided not to sell him, and I kept him, and he's been breeding for me ever since then. Uh, I think I've got two clutches on the way from him right now. Uh, I've actually got a clutch incubating from him too, so. He's doing a pretty good job. I'm asking a lot of them, and he's probably got 10, 10 or 11 females that I want to breed him to this year. Um, but he's, he's been breeding them okay, so and he's still eating and everything. So hopefully he will continue to do a good job for me, and I should have some of these available to sell uh, probably this summer sometime, this summer or fall. So the main focus that I have with ball pythons now is not necessarily to try and create something new. I do a lot of experimental breedings to see if I can make something new that looks good but I'm not really that much worried about getting the most complex genetic snakes. Like I don't care if I produce a 16 or 17 snake or something like that. Um, my main thing is to make snakes that people like. Uh, for example, blue edge assistics. Um, I just wanna make a lot of those because I know that I've got a lot of customers that request those. So I wanna make as many of them as I can. The customers tend to want what they want. You know, They want something that, that they think is a pretty animal. They don't necessarily, at least a lot of them, uh, especially people that want to get a snake as a pet. They don't necessarily care what the specific genes are in it. If you want a white snake with blue eyes, you want a white snake with blue eyes. It doesn't matter if a butter made it, or a lesser, or if you have Mojave in there, or Mystic, or whatever. Whatever the combination is, the end result is they just want a white snake with blue eyes. So I'm trying to, to do that. You know, when it comes down to it, I'm trying to produce pretty snakes that that the average person can look at and say, wow, that is a really cool snake, I want that in my collection. And I don't care if it has six genes in there, or seven genes in there, or anything like that, I just wanna make snakes that customers want to buy. And, and ones that I find appealing too. I mean, I, I do this because I, I love it, and I wanna make snakes that I like to look at too. I'm you know, one in here feeding and watering every day, I don't wanna look at snakes that I'm not interested in, I wanna look at really pretty snakes. So I figured that um, I wanna try to come up with different combinations of really attractive snakes that people will look at and say, I want that for my collection. And that's basically what I'm trying to do here with, with all these different uh, mutations that I have.
Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So right now I'm in Temecula, California. And you know, a couple of years ago, I did a video called Bodacious Boas here at the Reptile Shop with Mike Roscoe. He has some amazing boas. He showed us some amazing baby boas. And I'm gonna do a follow-up video to Bodacious Boas to see how those baby boas have grown over the past two years. So let's go see what's new with Mike Roscoe's Bodacious Boas. I'm Dave Kaufman and I am obsessed with reptiles. And I have been since I was nine years old. 25 years was a yeah, lot's changed fruition since then and uh one of the things we were working on last time was some storia stuff that's right and, i remember uh, that and uh oh yeah this is one of the babies from last season so i haven't met this girl yet this is actually a boy this boy yet and so you guys saw the female from the last episode and this is actually one of the babies from her. Wow. And uh, he's uh, he's making his making his uh, way toward hopefully uh, getting some jobs done this season. This is a uh, Scoria Jungle, 100% head shark. Nice. Turn that off for the sound. Yeah, there we exactly. go. So this is a Scoria Jungle, 100% head shark. And uh, it's a male, and I hope uh, we get some good action out of him soon. Two years old, you said? Yeah, so he's um, he's just shy of two. Wow, what a gorgeous snake. Scorias are my favorite. So he was born uh, June of uh, 17. June of 17, okay. And he's totally in blue. Of course, because I'm here filming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, why show off all your beautiful colors when, you know, you can shed tomorrow after I leave. Yeah, that's, he's literally, <laughs> but you can still see he's got some. Uh, oh yeah, even in shed, he glows in, shed, in the dark. He's got some cool stuff. Look going at that. On. And a lot of people ask how I know that he's jungle, and I've seen quite a few scorias. Yeah. And one of the one of the telltale signs is these dashes that are apparent on the side. Usually they're a little more symmetrical sure. and medallion shaped. So, so these are what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, right? so those yeah. are normally medallion shaped instead of instead of random dashes. Right, like right. You can see sure. on side, it's a lot of lines and dashes, and that's how I know he's a jungle. I'm really stoked though. I have big plans for this guy. I hope uh, he does some good stuff in the future. And then I'll I'll talk a little bit about uh, a lot of people say that um, scories have a head wobble, like a yeah, spider ball. Like a spider, ball. right? And I have some seen a few that have a little bit of a wobble. You can see this guy's got good loco uh, good locomotion. Yep. And uh, he treads well, he acts well. Yeah, that doesn't look like any wobble to me. No. What are your plans to breed him to? So I've got a couple options. So one of the options would be like a, like a big sharp snow glow female. Oh yeah. And uh, make some sharp sun glow scoria jungle stuff. Yeah. And then another option might be to make, breed him to uh, to a combo, like a, maybe like a high ball motley head sharp. Something that's gonna give me a little diversity and maybe a little more pattern. Sure. One of my likely candidates is a, uh, is a big Aztec head sharp female that's nice and dark and burgundy and I think that might uh and nobody's done Aztec scorias yet so I think it might be something cool nice yeah so scoria are my favorite boa for yeah, sure they're awesome and that one is just awesome thank you they, they top my list as well yeah definitely so definitely so let's go down the line so this is a this is a sharp snow or I'm sorry this is a VPI T positive snow glow um she's from 2016 as well and uh, actually, she's from 2016. She was sitting in her water bowl. And so this is the visual form of a hypo anathristic VPIT positive. Nice. So this is a female, and uh, she is from 16. I love what the hypo does to snow, but then. And you add that T positive and look at this. Yeah, exactly. That's like creamsicle color. <laughs> look at that. So this is another VPI girl that I'm holding back. Very nice. So this girl, she can be a little feisty, but uh, this is a Pink Panther Jungle Tea. Uh, VPI lineage as well. And uh, she's got a nice pink head, got yeah. good size. She looks kind of Aztec-y. Yeah, she's got a really good blocky pattern. Actually, she's an Aztec sibling. And, uh, and it's kind of funny, some of the Aztec siblings s seem to have a little bit more of a blocky pattern. Yeah, yeah. Cool, and what are you breeding her to? Uh, you know what, undetermined. I have some uh, some really cool IMG projects coming down the pipe. So I have some IMG VPI blood stuff stashed away at my house that uh, I'm hoping to put her in the mix with. because She's got killer color pattern. And I like the contrast. I yeah, definitely. Was. So uh, she, was a, she was a hold back just based on color and quality alone. Right. So in this room, basically, these are you know, up and coming breeders that are what about yeah, two, so, three years old so, in this so rack? These are all between a year and three, a year and two and a half years old. Yeah. These racks here. So these are all animals that we've 
selectively held, selectively held back from our production to raise up for going back in the main room eventually, and maybe replacing some of their parents down the road. Gotcha. And uh, and you know, up and game on some of the projects that I want to move forward on. Very cool. Very cool. Um, let's see. Well, we can we can look at some babies. I got yeah. Some babies. icing is going on there he's a very friendly snake so this is a red panther from the red panther lineage red so this panther. is just a regular red panther tea But this is what I've been shooting to make is like if you see a really red deep saturation in the tail and uh, and a lot of red in the saddles, that's going to continue to, as it progresses, to get darker and more mm -hmm. contrasty. And that's really what I'm working with. Yeah, fantastic. Well, in the follow-up to this follow-up video, we'll have to see what this one looks like. As yeah, well. this is a killer animal. Yeah, see if he's still, you know, sassy. It probably, <laughs> probably will be based on today. Yeah, yeah. Wow, gorgeous snake. So this is from our Red Panther project that we were talking about last year. Yeah, And this I is a Red these. Panther Sun Glow Jungle. Look at this one. Holy buckets. Yeah, this is one of the uh, the creme de la creme from the litter. I, li I really like that stripe all the way down. It's almost perfect connecting. There's a couple small breaks, but it doesn't get a whole lot more connected for a striped jungle than that. So this is a Sun Glow Jungle from the Red Panther line again. And uh, it's so it's a VPIT positive Red Panther Sun Glow Jungle. Yeah, looks like the Rosie Boa phase. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got those stripes. Yeah. Now, is the stripe genetic? The last one you were looking at, so this one and this one are actually siblings. Okay. So they're from the same litter. So it just shows kind of the variability that you have in some of your jungle lineage stuff. Okay, I'll take this one. <laughs> yeah, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Pink Panther, Red Panther, Pastel Dream, Monster Tail. There's a lot of different, and all these are, is all it is is nomenclature for... A pastel lineage so a, a, a lineage is somebody developed that has good color and has some differential looking variations in color from one right from one uh, strain to another but it's all it's all typically based on somebody's production so I the red panther gene actually came from uh, perfect predators and uh, and he, he worked with a couple of pastel Manny, lineages. sure yeah Manny worked with a couple of pastel lineages and I really liked what I saw so we've been doing a lot of work to refine that and kind of you know, jump in on the project nice. and make it somewhat of our own because we put a lot of work into it. Sure, sure. Very cool. All right. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on. So this is a Pink Panther Sun Glow Jungle female, and it's 66% uh, head annery that we're raising up. She's got a, like, if you look at her overall, she's got a real reduced look to her. Yeah. As far as color goes, it's a little bit muted. It is Comparative muted, yeah. to some of the other stuff that I've shown you, and that's because I believe that she's head annery. And what she would make is uh, what we were looking at earlier in the video, the snow glow, if it proves head anery, you'll make snow glow jungles. Right. So explain to us why you think that this is head anery because it's diffused. So the reason I think it's head anery, so anatheristic is the lack of a, of a color pigment, right? Sure. So when you have a lot of heterozygous animals that are carrying a heterozygous trait, sometimes they'll show some like little, uh, little hints or markers that people call. Right, like the and, train uh, tracks on a pod, right, a head pod, right. Train tracks on a head pod, exactly. So one of, the, one of the markers that I've noticed with stuff that's head anery or a possible head anery that proves is that it's got some muted color. So as opposed to siblings in the litter, you might have one that's bright and just, you know, clear as day, probably not going to prove. Got good contrast. You, but if you look at overall this animal, this animal's got a muted look. It's yeah. got white eyes. It's uh, it's got an overall lighter color than you would expect from a sun glow jungle. Right. So a lot of times the sun glows like uh, here. Let's do some comparison. So that's a. So those are both sun glow jungles, right? And yeah, they're different lineages. But you have a you have a really bright, bold color, sure. good contrast. And if you look at her. She's a lot lighter in color. Yeah. Reduce. It's, it's her color is muted overall a little bit, right? So that would suggest to me that she's probably head anery. Now she's 66% head, as the pairing was a head to a head. So she's got a 66% chance of proving head anery, and I I have a strong inkling that she's going to prove.
So uh, here we have another really killer. So this is actually a good example of just a regular Red Panther VPIT positive female that we're raising up. So this girl's a few years old, looking killer. She is. She's got killer. phenomenal contrast, a lot of color, beautiful snake. So now, did I see this girl last time I was here? So she was, yeah. You she was a baby. Did. She was probably a baby yeah. back then. So, so it's a couple I, years later. I remember this snake. She's looking great. She is looking wonderful. This is why I wanted to do this video. Was exactly. See the, see the updated set right. of the animals we saw before. Exactly. So we've got a so we've got an IMG head VPI pos head anery male, breeding an anery 100% head VPI female, and uh, she's got some good like follicular follicular development. You can see. If you yeah. Look, in here, she's got a little bit of swelling. She's starting to get a little bigger. Yeah. Looking nice. But look at this, though. You know, the males over here, females over here, they breed like my snakes do. <laughs> you know, he's been putting in work for, he's been putting in work for a little while. And yeah. uh, so IMG stands for increased melanin gene. And so what happens, these guys start out looking somewhat like a dark, ugly, normal snake almost. Right, right. And uh, as, they, as they get older and they shed, they increasingly have more melanin coming in. So hence the term increased melanin gene. So for their, about the first year of their life, they really, you see, you go, they go through what's kind of like an ontogenic color change. Mm -hmm. And they go from a light kind of average looking Colombian boa to an almost solid black boa in some instances. This guy's about in the middle. He's, you know, he's, this guy's about two years old, two and a half. He's nice and dark, got some really cool iridescence going on. And uh, he's a really good example of what I think a nice, good male solid IMG should look like. Yeah, definitely And, uh, is. and I, I'm really in love with the gene. I, I see a lot of potential uh, what for up, the future for some like the T positive IMG combos. Absolutely. Even just albino IMGs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm really stoked for him. I hope I hope it pans out. Yeah, me too. Next episode. Yeah, next episode. <laughs> right, right. The the, the next follow-up episode. Right, exactly. Exactly. Uh, do your job. Yeah. Get to work, buddy. Get to work. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of my favorite snakes. So this is a hypo jungle, 100% head VPIT positive from our Red Panther lineage. And she's just got phenomenal wow. color. Wow. Um, they've got like a lot of good orange, orangey red tones on the sides and nice good contrast saddles. With yeah. They're wow. uh, one of my favorites for sure. For sure. Yeah, she is gorgeous. So she was in the last episode. So she was in the last episode. She was in the last episode. So she was about two feet eating some uh, adult mice. Yeah. <laughs> now she's, uh, she's approaching breeding age. Nice. Um, I, I don't think we're going to breed her this year. We'll probably give her till next year. Sure. But she's uh, she's definitely on track to make some killer stuff. Fantastic. Let's see. So this is actually her dad right here. So this is... Uh, so this is dad. So this is dad. So he, so this guy's a killer quality example jungle. Her dad isn't as red as she is. No, not by any means. Yeah. You see... You know, they kind of the evolution of the progress that we're trying to work toward. Absolutely. This is, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal animal in my, in my left hand. And uh, we're just trying to breed for something that looks like him and yeah. does it look like this. Definitely. <laughs> so here's a snake that we showed you guys as a juvie last time you were here. A couple years later, she's definitely turning Whoa. nice and dark and uh, exa hope, doing exactly what I would have hoped she would have done. I remember this So this, this is baby. an Aztec Sharp, or Aztec Jungle 100% Het Sharp. And uh, and I, she's doing exactly everything that I would have hoped for. Um, wow. I have big plans for her in the future, and I think she's going to make some incredible animals. Now the, the the downfall. So she's got everything I want in Aztec pattern, you know, jungle pattern, everything I want. But the downfall is uh, jungle to jungle is not a good combo. Why is jungle to jungle not a good combo? Jungle to jungle, they, they'll survive, but they just they don't thrive. And you know, and I'm not trying to make stuff that has a compromise sure. quality of life. So, so is it like Jag Carpet Python to Jag Carpet so Python Jag Carpet or not as severe? So, th so what happens is you get an animal that is born, it lives, and usually, like we had one here that lived nine years, and that's the longest living one that I know of. So yeah, far. yeah. And uh, they just they just don't have, they kind of have a failure to thrive thing going on. Yeah. They just don't thrive, they don't kick butt, they don't reproduce. From, from what I understand, I hear some people say that they may have gotten some super jungle sure. to produce. I didn't have a lot. All right, look at this. Fresh from the Pomona Super Show. Yeah, that's just we're unpacking. The show was yesterday. We're just getting back in the mix, getting things put away. Yeah. Separated. But I uh, figured before I put it away, we need some stuff out so we can do some videos with you guys and show you some of the cool stuff. Right on, right on. Because I didn't film these enough at the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you were telling me about this feisty little dude. Was a wild caught hypo? So his dad was uh, was from a Colombian import. 
and it was, a, it was like 1,500 animals, and we had picked them out, and we thought he was a hypo, and this was about 14 years ago. Yeah. And uh, so my buddy Mike Neely actually had him, and uh, he's actually the one that got him. He picked him out. And I picked out another female that I thought had some circled back ladder tail characteristics. And when Mike moved, he brought me the mail. He was kind of cutting back. Sure. And um, so uh, produced a bunch of normal looking babies, but a couple of them had a weird kind of hue to them. So I kept the pair back, and after about seven years of trying to get them to produce, we finally got a litter out of them. Seven years. Seven years. Wow. Well, actually, eight. I'm sorry, eight years. Eight years. Sorry, so All right. Four years old and three years of trying to breed them. They, they finally went. And 25% uh, and, uh, and of the litter came out like a T-positive. And uh, we don't know what kind of T-positive it is, but uh, we don't know if it's compatible with anything else. But we do know that it's definitely some kind of T-positive albino, and it doesn't look like anything else that we've had or seen. Yeah, that definitely looks caramel. We haven't named the project yet. <laughs> We don't know what it's going to be called. Um, Name it the Rattle On Morph. Yeah, the Rattle On Morph. Yeah. So you heard it here first. Here's the Rattle On Morph of the boa. You're not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you run your game, man. <laughs> Mark, that sounds like a good marketing ploy, man. I'm game. Oh, right on, man. Yeah, that is a good marketing ploy for me. <laughs> you always have some of the coolest stuff going on here. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do like. 12 more videos just on <laughs> everything you've got going on here. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to have some cool projects in our hands. And yeah, well. I look forward to the future of boas and the future of reptiles yep, in general. Man. Absolutely. It's, well, uh, your, your hard work and dedication, <laughs> yeah, you deserve all the success that. you have. I appreciate that, man. We're, right we're, on. we're working toward uh, making some cool stuff for everybody. And you are. So we came back to check on these two. Hey, he's getting closer. Starting to massage her a little bit. How long have these guys been paired up? So these guys have been paired up about three weeks. And three weeks? Yeah, about three weeks. So usually the male will get in and they'll kind of, for the first couple of days, they'll kind of feel each other out. The male will try to ride her around. And if she's receptive, she'll let them. Yeah, right, her. right. And uh, I saw a walk from these guys about two weeks ago. And I've seen some follicular development from her. You can tell that she's got some swelling going on. If yeah, look, she's got some girth. If you look close, you can see uh, it's a little bit bumpy in here. Yeah. So you can see like like one, two, three. Those bumps that are in that section of the body, those are going to be follicles that are developing. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what we hope that those will be one day will turn into ova and become babies. Sure. But he's gorgeous. Yeah, I love that male. He's a, he's a phenomenal male. He's a proven breeder. And... Uh, he just, he's a, he's a good, he's a stud male. Yeah. He gets it done. So this is a male super sun glow jungle. And what that is, and that's a super hypo jungle sharp albino. So he's got, he's got four genes going down there. He's got hypo twice, sharp albino, and jungle. Gotcha. And the female is a sharp snow glow. So the female is a hypo anatheristic sharp albino. And I don't have a lot of anery stuff in my sharp gene. So I'm trying to bring a little bit into it. Yeah. Down the road, I'd like to make some uh, some like sharp snow glow combo scoria stuff. Score. I was just gonna say yeah, the albino so, scoria. Exactly. So I'd like to bring some some uh, anery, and we also have an IMG sharp project we're working on this year. Nice. Um, that's actually uh, he's been breeding over on that side of the room. He's a IMG 100% head sharp snow. Oh, nice. And so he's breeding some of the uh, some of the hypo jungles and jungle stuff that we have. Fantastic. And what we're gonna do down the road is hopefully end up with the, <coughs> the, you know completely unrelated outcross animals that are IMG sharp stuff and uh, scoria sharp stuff that we can then put together down the road and make some really killer, you know, maybe the possibilities could be, you know, even a snow glow jungle IMG scoria. Okay, there definitely will be a follow up <laughs> video to this follow up yeah, video. Yeah, exactly. So so we keep 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 the progression going. Right I'm, on. I'm really excited for this. Stuff. Totally. I'm excited to see what you what uh, what comes out of this yeah. pairing and all the pairings yeah, you do. I'll send so you some I'll please send you some do, pictures. please I'll, do. Maybe in the maybe in the comments of this video. When the litter comes down the road, I'll upload some pictures. Oh, of that would be idea. awesome. Yes, fantastic. Sure. The rattlers would love that. That'd so, awesome. Mike, thank All you right. so much for having me yeah, over awesome. here and awesome. uh, showing me how these babies and how these juveniles are, you know, growing up and becoming breeders. And that's exactly why I wanted to do this. I'm so, glad you guys came back to yeah. see some of the progression, see some of the animals you guys saw, you know, as babies now, you know, jumping into the breeder room and making their way into our collection and 
hopefully uh, into your guys' hands eventually. Awesome, awesome. And definitely there will be another follow-up video to this follow-up <laughs> we'll video. Let's keep rolling. So cool, cool, awesome, cool. man. Thanks for coming, Dave. Right on, man. Thanks for having me. So, Rattlers, there will definitely be a follow-up video to this video. And like Mike said, he's going to try to post some pictures as these babies are being raised up and what they look like on our social media. I'm going to put links to all of our social media and Mike's social media. So be sure to check that out. That'll be in the description below. Also, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and as always, hit that bell so you never miss. This is Emily with Snake Discovery. Uh, ball pythons are probably the most popular pet snake, at least in the United States. They compete very closely with corn snakes, but because of everybody wanting us to do this sort of video, today we're going to be discussing how to properly set up an enclosure for a ball python and how to take care of one. Let's begin with a proper setup for a ball python, and we'll go into the other details later. There are two main routes you can take for what to house your ball python in, one of which being a glass aquarium, and the other option being a plastic tote or tub. Now there's a big controversy on which one works best with each species of snake. If you want to learn the pros and cons of each side, we recommend just watching this video right here because I'm not going to go into details with, about that today. Instead, if we had to choose one or the other for a ball python, we would recommend a plastic tote. So that's what we're going to set up in today's video. You want the size of your enclosure to be big enough to allow the ball python to fully stretch out along two sides of the tank or bin. And this is the bare minimum requirement for a ball python. And preferably, you want the enclosure to be big enough so that they can stretch out along just one side and that just gives them that much more room to roam around. But if it's too big, the snake will actually feel a bit exposed and they may not want to eat because they feel vulnerable. So you don't want to put a baby ball python in a huge 40 gallon tank right away. You want to wait until they're big enough to grow into it first. Ball pythons grow to around four to possibly five feet for larger females. Males typically stay on the smaller side. So as they grow, you're going to, of course, have to increase the size of their enclosure as they outgrow the old ones. The style of the bin is important as well. This one, we're just going to be sliding right into our snake rack so there is no lid involved in our. Seems obvious, but it's very important and often overlooked. And of course, another obvious thing is to make sure to drill holes in the side of the bin. We heat mats is that these can and will overheat. They get too hot. There's no dial or anything in the cord to turn them up or down. So if you want to prevent your snake from getting burned, and of course everybody does, make sure that you use a thermostat along with the mat. So this is something you'll have to buy separately. We use and recommend the Jumpstart brand of thermostat. Now how these work is the plug on the heat mat will plug right into the thermostat. And then this cord plugs right into the wall and then you can turn the temperature up or down to the recommended 90 degrees for ball pythons warm spot set it and then this will actually heat up the mat and control the mat's temperature and it'll turn it on and off as needed to keep it within two degrees above or below 90. Now the last cord on this thermostat is very important. This leads to the probe. The probe here will actually measure, this is the thermometer essentially, and it measures the temperature of wherever it's sitting. And so you want to set this where the ball python will be sitting right above the heat mat. This goes inside of the enclosure, not outside of it, because of course the ball python is inside of the enclosure. The unfortunate thing is these thermostats come with this little suction cup that will stick you know, temporarily to the plastic, but it doesn't take much for the ball python to just push it and then it, be, it pops right off. And when the probe pops off, it reads the cooler temperature since it's further away from the heat mat. And that makes the thermostat think that it's cooler in the enclosure, so it turns up the heat mat and then it can get too hot. To prevent that from happening, you need to just very securely attach this probe to directly above the heat mat. And I don't even use the suction cups anymore. 
Instead, we use silicone sealant. And you want to use the 100% silicone. It's safe for uh, fish, it's safe for reptiles. This comes in just the bottle alone, and then you put it into a silicone gun, and then you can press the silicone out. Then you can stick that probe right on the bottom of the enclosure where it will stay. Of course, you'll have to wait a couple hours for the silicone to dry before you can move on to the next step. But for today's video, since again, this bin isn't being set up like what you're probably gonna set yours up like at home, this is just getting slid into our snake rack. Um, we're not gonna attach the uh, probe in this video. So I'll just clear that out to make it a little bit easier to follow, but assume that I have a heat mat and a for the bedding or the substrate for ball pythons to go more of a drier route instead of a wet route like tropical soil. Some people will use tropical soil or cypress or some other humidity retaining bedding, but if a ball python is constantly sitting on wet bedding, they can develop scale rot issues on their belly. Because if you think about it, in the termite mounds, it's humid air, but it's not actually wet where they're sitting. The substrate we recommend because of all of this is just cheap old Aspen fibers. You can also use things like newspaper or paper towels, but as soon as the ball python goes to the bathroom, that'll get soaked up in the paper products and it'll bump up the humidity and then the ball python is also sitting in its waste more. Rather than with aspen fibers, the, these actually soak up, kind of like a kitty litter box almost, soak up the, uh, the poops and then you can just spot clean as needed. You don't have to replace everything after the snake just goes to the bathroom once. Since ball pythons aren't a burrowing species of snake like hog noses are, you don't have to provide them with very deep bedding. Just an inch or so will do just fine. This is actually the perfect amount. I wasn't expecting that. Now I'm actually going to, I changed my mind, I'm gonna slide this heat mat underneath the side of the tank, to, or the bin, to remind us that this is going to be our warm side of the enclosure. After the bedding, it's time to add the decor in the enclosure. The, first and foremost, you need hides or caves. You want at least one hide on the warm end and one hide on the cool end, so that way the snake can remain w hidden, whether it wants to be warm or cool. And some people will use like half logs like this. They don't really count as one of the two hides because they can't be completely hidden inside of these. You can add them anyway, just for added enrichment, but you still need the caves as well. If you want, you can buy the fancy rock or resin style caves at pet stores or online, but honestly, mushroom containers <laughs> that are cleaned out with a little um, door cut into them work just fine for young ball pythons. So I'm just going to set this on one side. This will be the warm end cave. And again, also we're just pro uh, recycling, whatever you can, and that also makes it uh, a little bit cheaper. We'll put our other hide on the cool end. Next, you can't forget having a water dish big enough for the snake to soak in. You can buy the, again, the fancy reptile dishes, or you can buy dishes for small animals. It doesn't really matter. As long as it holds water and the snake can fit in it, that's all you need. One thing to keep in mind, though, is getting a dish that is, first off, deeper, so the water doesn't just evaporate right away. And also, you want one with a heavy base, otherwise the snake's just gonna tip it over. I recommend putting the water dish on the cool end of the enclosure. If you put it on the warm end, it'll just evaporate right away and increase humidity in the entire enclosure. And this is good, of course, for tropical species of snakes that need uh, an environment with overall high humidity. But again, with ball pythons, we recommend more of a drier setup. So water dish on the cool end. To replicate that termite mound, that warm, humid retreat for the snake like they would experience in the wild, you can't fit a termite mound, of course, in the enclosure. So instead, just give them a humidity box. This is just a Tupperware container. It'll act as your termite mound. And it's big enough for the snake to, of course, curl up in, filled about halfway with damp moss. To dampen the moss, you just take this dry moss, and we use sphagnum moss, by the way, you can take this and just dip it in water and set it back in. You don't want uh, standing water inside of the humidity box because again, if it's sitting in like standing water, that can cause scale rot issues. I have just uh, wet and re -wet and or hydrated the uh, moss in here. Put the lid back on. The lid should have a hole that's cut that's of course big enough for the snake to enter and exit. I would not put the entrance on the side because then as the snake exits, it's just gonna pull out all the moss with it. I found it works better to just put the, the, the entrance to the humidity box on top. And we're going to put this on the warm end of the enclosure so that it stays hot and humid inside. You can kind of build up the sides of the substrate so it's easier for the snake to access. And now it might take a couple of weeks before the snake figures out how to use this, but once they do, they seem to use it like the perfect amount. Ball pythons are really good at not overusing their humidity box. You'll usually see them in here when they're about to shed their skin. 
And if you use a humidity box, you will never have issues with your snake shedding. I can almost guarantee it. We never have problems with stuck shed uh, ever since we started using these. Now back to that half log, I'm going to still use it. It's not gonna count as one of the hides, but it will count for enrichment. It's great to add some enrichment opportunities, some climbing branches for this ball python. Yeah, they do hide most of the time, but when they're hungry, they're active at night. So you may as well give them some things to explore. So you can use fake branches, fake leaves. You can use half logs. You can get fake plants not only at just pet stores, but you can actually buy them a lot cheaper at craft stores. You can even grab branches from outside as long as they haven't been um, sprayed with any pesticides and as long as they're sterilized by either baking them in the oven or pouring boiling water on them. Once you're done putting some decorations in, you have to take a look at it and think, is this too much? for my ball python because too much is actually a thing. You want them to have, you know, enough room to actually slither around. And honestly, this half log is probably a little bit big for this enclosure. We'd recommend the smaller version because this takes up a lot of her slithering space. So, I mean, it's uh, debatable, but if uh, this were my enclosure, I'd probably swap out this big one for a smaller one. But this is the only one we have today, so this is what we're gonna use. Not only do these rocks and leaves and structures make the environment look more natural and uh, appealing to the eye, but they're actually essential to the snake itself. Things to climb on and explore and smell provide mental stimulation to the snake throughout the day, and enrichment is very important to their mental well-being. It's important to make sure that at least some of the structures have a rough surface so that when the snake is shedding, it can rub its body up against them to help peel that old skin off. If you use only plastic hides and plastic humidity boxes, they'll have nothing rough to rub up against and then the skin can stick. But even something simple as a few rocks in the tank will suffice. Of course, we don't want to forget to add water to the water dish. Now, amphibians are very sensitive to chlorine in city water, but I found that with all of our snakes, you can use tap water, city water, well water, uh, it all works just fine. I don't have to dechlorinate it for the snakes. The one water to avoid is distilled water because that removes all of the natural minerals from the water itself. And some of those minerals are good and they are essential to the snake. So don't use distilled water. Once you have everything set up, let it sit for a few hours with the thermostat on, the heat mat on, just let it kind of settle. And then a, a tool that we recommend every reptile owner has, have, I think that would be right, recommend you have, is a temperature gun. Some people use the little circular thermometers, but those don't work because they stick to the back of the enclosure, like either up high where the snake isn't gonna be, and you want the temperature to be red right where the snake is actually going to be hiding. With a temperature gun, you can just click it all around the enclosure. You can test the temperature wherever you want, under the hides, make sure that warm spot is around 90 degrees, give or take a couple degrees, and you can verify all of your parameters are correct before you add the snake. Once you have ensured that your temperature is good and everything is set up, then you can do the most exciting part, which is adding your new ball python to the enclosure. We're going to just set her, and we'll set her there. We'll see where she wants to go. Ball pythons aren't very quick, so uh, it might take a while for her to get comfy. <laughs> After you bring your new ball python home, leave it alone for like a week. A full week is enough time for it to settle down, get used to its new surroundings, and then after the week has passed, then you can try feeding it for the first time. Baby ball pythons should be fed once every five to seven days. We definitely recommend feeding frozen thawed rodents over live, since live rodents do have a decent possibility of biting the snake back. And if you talk to any veterinarian, they will all recommend that as well. Once your ball python grows and gets bigger, it's going to take larger rodents or larger meals, so you're going to reduce the frequency that you feed your snake to once a week to once every other week, depending on its age. By the way, these are often called royal pythons in Europe because they were often worn around the necks of royalty, but in the United States, we call them ball pythons because when they're scared, they will typically, oh, of course, she's, she's too used to people, but they, they curl up into a ball and protect their face in the middle, hence ball python. Although this setup works great for ball pythons, it also works great for just about any species of colubrid that is commonly kept as a pet. King snakes, corn snakes, milk snakes, you can use this type of setup for hognose snakes, bull snakes. With some species of snakes, you have to keep an eye on the humidity box to make sure they don't overuse it, since some will, but I won't go into details about that here. So that just about covers it. So they're very easy to take care of, easy to set up, as long as you, you know, do it correctly, of course. And they're very hardy, amazing first, like, beginner pet snakes. 
If you want to learn more about some of those other subjects we haven't covered today, like feeding inside their enclosure or outside of their enclosure, or housing them in a glass tank versus a bin, uh, I will link to those videos at the end of this one so you can learn more there. But anyway, thanks for joining us today and learning about ball python cage setup, and we'll see you next time. She's trying to poop again. Really? All right, well, let's just get this out of you. I am glad you did not do that on me just now. Ew. We're just gonna get this taken care of first, and then Ready? she'll be empty. Come on. Get it all out. Wait till after we're, we're sh done shooting, and then you can poop more if you really want to. Okay, try that again. I'm glad you did not do that on. Hey guys, this is Emily with Snake Discovery, and today we'll be discussing one of many controversial subjects in the reptile community. We'll be going over the pros and cons of each side, and then discussing what we have found to work best with our own animals. This is one of those subjects that a lot of reptile keepers and breeders have strong opinions about, and as a result, we will be keeping an eye on the comment section below. Uh, constructive comments are more than welcome. However, if things kind of get out of hand, basically harassment will not be tolerated, so those comments will be removed. And if it gets too bad, we will have to disable comments for this video. So please remember to play nice in the comment section below. Anyway, I hope this video helps you out when it comes to taking care of your own reptiles, and enjoy! Today we'll be discussing the highly debated topic of whether to feed your snake in its enclosure or in a separate feeding bin. But before we get started, since everyone's probably wondering, this is my false water cobra and he will be joining us during today's discussion. He really likes to cuddle, so he'll just kind of chill on my hand here. Yes, you're so sweet. I love this snake. He is awesome. Let's start with feeding your snake in its enclosure. A pro to feeding in the enclosure is that it's more natural for the snake because in the wild, a snake isn't being moved to a container to eat, it's eating where it lives. So as a result, a snake might be less stressed out eating in its own enclosure as opposed to being moved to a feeding container. More on that later. A con to feeding in the enclosure is that people for a long time have believed that a snake will become strikey if it's fed in its enclosure because it will associate your hand going into its tank with having food and therefore maybe being food. However, this would only happen if the only time you went into the enclosure were to feed the snake. Then it might start to associate the two things. But most keepers, including yourself most likely, will reach into the enclosure at different times throughout the week to hold and just handle your snake in general. And by doing that, your snake will not associate your hand with being food. Also because your hand doesn't smell like a mouse or look like a mouse to the snake, they have no reason to think that your hand is food. I have seen this association once with a young bull snake that we have actually upstairs right now. Uh, it was a younger bull snake that I would only open the bin to once a week feed and check water. Occasionally I'd go in a second time just for another check throughout the week, but she started to associate my hand with being food. And when I opened up the bin, she would slither at me mouth open expecting a mouse. So what I did was once or twice a week, I would reach in and handle her, and I haven't had a single problem since. It doesn't take much handling for a snake to learn not to associate your hand with being food. Another con to feeding in the enclosure is that the snake may ingest bedding while it's eating its food. If your snake ingests some of their bedding when they're eating their food, it's not that big of a deal because they can digest some substrate. And if you think about it, they have to digest some little bits that stick to their prey in the wild. It's when they ingest large amounts that it can cause impaction issues. This is more often seen with frozen thawed rodents instead of live because when you're feeding a frozen thawed rodent, it's usually wet when you offer it to the snake and the snake will grab that rodent and then drag it around its bedding before eating it, and it sticks to a lot of that bedding, and then it eats the bedding as well. You might be thinking to yourself, well, snakes in the wild will sometimes eat bedding, and you know that's true. Sometimes their substrate in the wild will stick to their prey items, uh, but their substrate is a little different than the substrate that we offer them in captivity, and snakes that eat something in the wild, they might die. They might get sick or injured from eating that. So why would we want to risk that happening to our snakes in captivity? Our job is to make their environments as safe as possible. Anyway, one way you can get around the fact that they might ingest some bedding is to either not use any bedding at all, which we like to use some bedding with our snakes because it offers a form of enrichment. 
So the other thing you can do is when you feed a snake and you're using bedding, put their mouse on a dish of some sort inside of their enclosure. That way the mouse is separated from the substrate and it's less likely to get stuck on it. However, we found that some of our snakes will take that mouse and they will pull it off of the tray and drag it all around their bedding anyway. So we've taken it one step further and we'll take their plastic hide and flip it upside down and place the mouse inside of there. This we've found reduces the chance of them dragging it in their bedding drastically. Now let's move on to feeding a snake in a separate container. Obviously there's no chance of any bedding being ingested because there is no bedding in a container. It also is kind of nice because it contains the mess of the mouse or whatever you're feeding your snake. However, there is a chance that with your snake it might get stressed out from moving from their enclosure to a feeding bin and then they won't want to eat. Some will eat, but then they'll get too stressed out from moving from that feeding bin back into their enclosure and they may regurgitate their meal. Regurgitation, although it shouldn't kill your snake, is something you want to avoid at all costs because once a snake regurgitates, we recommend waiting 14 days-ish, about two weeks, before offering food again. A really good breeder friend of ours taught us that the stomach acids inside of a snake will come up with the rodent when it regurgitates and it will irritate the throat or the esophagus on the rodent's way up. So you want to give the snake a full two weeks for all of those resulting um, scabs in its throat to heal. If you feed too soon, the rodent coming back down, the new rodent might just open up all those scabs again. A lot of people online say wait at least five to seven days so that the gut flora can replenish. It's up to you how long you wait. We just like to play it safe and we wait a full two weeks but avoiding regurgitation altogether is the key. Now, although some snakes will stress out and they either won't eat or they will regurgitate as a result of being moved into a feeding bin, a lot of snakes don't mind at all and they could care less where they eat. We have some snakes that will eat straight from our hands, like they honestly don't care. Some of them are so good that we can actually bring them to programs and I'll bring them to a school and they will eat a rodent in front of an audience. And despite having a car ride to the school, they will still eat and having a car ride back home, we've never had an issue with regurgitation. But we do have a few snakes at home that will regurgitate if they're looked at the wrong way, it seems. So it really just depends on the snake and their own stress levels. Another con to feeding a snake in a feeding bin is that it may get into what we call food mode, where once they eat something, then everything around them is potential food. They're, they're not the brightest animals. I mean, they're adorable. But when they get into food mode, that's when you kind of have to watch your hands. To get around this, you can wash your hands so they don't smell like rodents. You can also let the snake kind of settle down after eating for about 15 minutes before moving it back into its enclosure. And when you move it, you can either use a snake hook or you can take its feeding bin and you can maneuver it in a way near the enclosure so that the snake can slither in on its own. When we first got into reptiles, we used to take them all out and put them into separate feeding containers. But once we got so many snakes, we decided that, you know, that's way too much work. And we started feeding them in their own enclosures just because it was more convenient. And, you know, I did find that I had a better feeding response from the snakes when I fed them in their own enclosures. But I still have about 10 snakes or so that I will feed in separate enclosures just, just because they don't mind, they don't regurgitate, they eat every time. And they are used to feeding in separate enclosures because they are the ones that I bring to schools with me and to other events like that. So they eat a rodent in front of an audience. So since it's what they're used to, I keep it the same when I feed them at home too. All of the breeders that we know feed their snakes in their own enclosures just because it would be way too much work to move all of their snakes. Some have over a hundred snakes into a separate enclosure just to feed them. So because of the convenience factor, a lot of breeders will feed the snakes in their own enclosures. All that being said, we have found that the technique of moving a snake into a small feeding bin, if it's a picky snake, will sometimes increase its chances of eating. Because then it's just the snake and its food and it's going to bump into it as it slithers around. And that feeding bin is going to smell like rodents, especially if it's been used before. And that will help get the snake primed and ready to eat. We have gotten a lot of picky hognose snakes to start eating using that technique. But again, it won't work on every snake. We've just found to work on several picky snakes. Remember, each snake is different and their individual eating habits are unique. We have a couple snakes upstairs who will only eat if I wiggle the mouse in the perfect way in front of their mouth. Snakes are picky eaters. Come on. It's kind of cute. Yeah. And if they get like, stressed out after they eat, they puke. <laughs> and then you can't beat it for two weeks. <laughs> well then. <laughs> Seriously, I was not expecting that. 
But these things are supposed to like fuck rats up and shit all day. Shit them out, you know. But these things That's eat like twice a month. They eat twice a month. I didn't think they would get stressed and just puke it all up. You'd think their system would handle just about And I have other snakes. I thought they'd eat once a day or something. Who will only shit. eat if no. they're in a separate enclosure covered up with a towel. Look at this just snake. This is a hog nose. Them in the mouth. Once a snake gets used to eating in its enclosure or a feeding bin, it can be difficult to switch them <laughs> to the other one. So if you're buying a snake, make sure you ask the breeder or its previous owner what it's eating, how often. Yep, you better. eating and where it is eating, whether it's in its enclosure or that feeding bin. Even if you're not a fan of feeding in the enclosure, if the snake is used to feeding in another bin, the important thing is that your snake is eating. So you may have to change your technique based on the snake's individual preferences. Another thing to keep in mind is if your snake is eating in a separate bin and then it regurgitates, maybe it'd be best for that particular snake to start being fed in its enclosure. However, if you have a snake that isn't eating, you may have to try a few of these different techniques in order to get it to eat. Again, the important thing is that it eats and it doesn't regurgitate. Whichever technique your snake needs in order to get that happen is what you should be using. Ed and I think that the member from ballpythons.net with the username JLC said it perfectly. She said, I think whatever works are the operative words here. Plenty of people are successful at feeding in separate containers, and if it's working for them, then there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. What makes it all sound so conflicting is when folks insist, either intentionally or unintentionally, that their way of doing it is the only right way. Keep this in mind when you see somebody who's using a different feeding technique than yours, because what works for your snakes might not necessarily work for the other keeper and their snakes. Anyway, I hope this video has helped you out, maybe opened your eyes to both sides of this controversy, and remember to keep doing your own research so that you can make your own well-informed decisions. And in the end, the health of your animal is your number one priority. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, this is Emily with Snake Discovery and
Today we'll be discussing soils like hognose snakes. You can give them aspen fibers so that they can burrow, but those aspen fibers stay dry. Whereas if you have a more tropical species of snake, like say a false water cobra, you can use something like cypress bedding to retain humidity levels for them. Of course, we've kind of touched on it earlier, but if you use a substrate, the snake, if it ingests some of that substrate to retain humidity, oh, but those aspen fibers stay dry. Whereas if you have a more tropical species of snake, like say a false water cobra, you can use something like cypress bedding to retain humidity levels for them. Of course, we've kind of touched on it earlier, but if you use a substrate, the snake, if it ingests some of that substrate, it's only going to ingest a small amount, you know, a small amount that sticks to the rodent. You still want to reduce the amount of substrate they ingest as much as you can, but at least using a substrate, make sure that they don't eat all of the substrate in their enclosure like they would if they had a paper towel that got stuck to their rodent. Another pro to using substrate is that you can easily spot clean different sections in the enclosure. So say for our snakes, we feed them Hey guys, this is Emily with Snake Discovery, and today... Hey everyone, this... Good day everyone, my name is Mary, and today I'm going to make a little video answering some of the questions you guys have about my snakes. For those of you who don't know, I have two ball pythons. Now, ball pythons, or royal pythons as they're also called, are one of the most docile, submissive, calmest snakes ever that, I, that I'm aware of. They are the calmest snakes ever. They are called ball pythons because their natural response to any kind of stimulus really is to curl up into a ball. They're not aggressive, they're not very territorial, and they're just very, very good starter snakes. Ball pythons are also incredibly popular because of the vast range of morphs that they come in. Morphs is the term used to describe the colors and their patterns. There is literally so many. I've been trying so hard to learn a lot of the morphs just because I really, really like these snakes, but there are hundreds upon hundreds of different morphs and new morphs are being created all the time. Five years ago, there was a tiny fraction of the morphs that there are available today. In terms of getting a snake that is a particular color or that has a particular pattern that you like, ball pythons do have such a huge range. Now the normal ball pythons can be very very cheap, like 40, 50 bucks, and the very very special morphs or the very rare colorations can go for like $10,000, I'm not even exaggerating here. When the banana morph came out, those snakes were priced $5,000 and higher and now you can get them for like $300-ish, depending on where you look. Now, the two snakes that I have, both of them, like I said, both of them are ball pythons. One of them is a pastel ivory, and this is Ben, and that's who I'm about to show you. And our newest snake is a VPI exanthic, and her name is Meryl, and I'll show you her later. So this is Ben's terrarium. You can keep ball pythons in tubs or in rack systems, but I personally prefer to keep them in a tank like this because I feel like it's more natural but ball pythons are very easy to care for but I have nothing against people who keep theirs in tanks so long as they're kept in a healthy environment that is totally fine but anyway this is Ben's terrarium it is kind of split into two sides this is his hot side and this is his cold side it is very very important that you have a heat gradient for any kind of snake. Snakes are cold-blooded animals, they need to be able to regulate their internal body temperature, otherwise they cannot properly digest their food, and they need to be able to go to a place that is hot when they need to warm up, and go to a place that is cool when they need to cool down. Now, the best method of heating up your terrarium, or your tub if you're keeping your snakes in tubs, is with a heat pad. Now you may notice we actually have a heat lamp as well and I'll talk to you about why in just a second. A heat pad gets stuck to the bottom of the tank. I can't show you because I can't lift up the tank there. It's actually really heavy. But it is stuck to the bottom of this tank here. This is the cord that comes out of it. And it is attached to a thermostat like you can see here. The thermostat is pretty much essential guys. You need to be able to set the temperature and to be able to properly regulate the temperature. Something like a heat rock that you cannot regulate the temperature on, I do not at all recommend because you have no way to tell if it's too hot and your snake or your lizard or whoever else you has won't be able to immediately tell if they're being hurt by it and they can get severely badly burned and, and the result of those burns can be fatal. So it is really important that you have a thermostat. Now because this tank is 
big. I can't remember the exact dimensions of it. Uh, we have the heat lamp up here, you can see. To help raise the ambient temperature of this whole kind of top side of the tank, the two essential things to have on the hot side of your tank, aside from your heat mat, is a water bowl and a hide. It's also nice to have a little thermometer, even though it is regulated down there, and we also have an electric thermometer, so that we can just click and see what the temperature is on the hot side here. The water inside this bowl evaporates very quickly and I fill it up pretty much every day and that also is a water bottle that I use to help mist the tank and to help him stay hydrated oh and look he's gonna say hello hey little buddy he can hear me out here talking and he probably thinks it's feeding time <laughs> on the cold side of the tank we have the same things we have a water bowl and we have another hide that hide is a lot bigger than that hide. We have this exact same hide on both sides of the tank, but he actually is kind of too big for this hide. He doesn't use his hot hide as much as he uses his cold hide, but we couldn't fit two of these big hides in here. So once he really does outgrow this one, we are gonna have to rearrange it a little bit more, take out some of his fun things so that we can fit in a full-sized hide for him. He spends the grand majority of his time in his cold hide and that's, that's plenty big enough. If anything, that's a little bit too big for him. Then we have these fun little climbing things in his skull, which is too big to fit inside of now, but I like how it looks. We have a log at the back here that he can go fully inside of at the back, which serves as another warm hide. And he has this tree, which he does sometimes climb on, but ball pythons aren't climbing snakes. They like to be on the ground. So while they can sometimes utilize trees and branches and stuff, they're not like a tree python, which likes to live up high. <laughs> oh, I love that he's coming out to say hi to me while I'm talking. He's such a cutie pie. Okay, so Ben is, hmm, about a year old. Opening the door is scary. Hey, boo-boo. <laughs> All of those little pits or those nostrils, some of you guys think they're nostrils, those are actually heat pits and they're for thermal regulation. Like I said earlier, he needs to be able to tell hot from cold so that he can keep his body temperature where it needs to be. And those adorable little pits on his snoot help him to sense heat. I will open this up and take him out. He's going to jump back a little bit while I open it because it's scary. There's my beautiful boy. See what I mean about him being pretty much too big for this hide now. You get deceived by the size of his head. So, like I said, ball python, not gonna bite you. Okay, so this is Ben. I think the last time I showed Ben in a video, he was quite a bit smaller than this, so he has grown quite a lot. He is a very healthy weight for his age. He's a really good eater. I will talk a little bit more about feeding in a little bit because bull pythons are notoriously bad at eating. He is extremely good at being handled. <laughs> he is absolutely beautiful, as you can see. He's become a lot more yellow as he's gotten older. <laughs> he is a very curious snake. He has these beautiful markings on his face which kind of look like angry eyebrows, which I love. And he has a very faint pattern on his back. He isn't pure white. He's not a super Mojave or a blue-eyed Lewistic or anything. He's not albino. A lot of people think that they see a white snake and they're albino. White snakes or albino snakes actually have orange and yellow markings on them or orange or yellow depending on which kind of albino it is. And also at the bottom of his tail it's kind of purple which I don't know if you'll be able to pick up the colors there properly but it's kind of yellow little yellow streak with purple on the sides <laughs> they have very good grip <laughs> is there anything you think you want to say to people who would consider getting a ball python pretty cool <laughs> Can't boop on the nose. Boop. They back away like no, no. Boop the snoot. But they have super pretty little faces. They look like little puppy dog faces. Yeah, they got little head boobs. boobs. Little head boobs. Boop. Stop it! Stop <laughs> moving me. So like I said, Ben is about a year old. And so you compare his size to the baby's size. Now she's looking out at us. 
All right, so this is baby Meryl. She's got the same setup. See, she has identical hides in her hot side and her cold side. She's, she looks like she's grown a little bit. Yeah, she's a little bigger. She was very tiny when we got her. But Meryl and Ben, some of the differences that I noticed, apart from their coloring, is that Meryl will stick her tongue out way more than Ben will. So she's sticking her tongue out to uh, get senses of what's around her. She's tasting the air, but it's also kind of their sense of smell. And whereas Ben will barely ever do that. I just think he does not care what's around him. So she is a VPI Exanthic, and they're kind of more of a silvery gray color, but she looks a little more brown than, than silver, which is still a very pretty snake. But a little bit of substrate stuck in her mouth. Well, let's get it. <laughs> She does not want her snoop boop. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right, so feeding size. You think they've got such tiny little heads and necks that you want to feed them something small, but you actually feed them something that's the same size as the largest point of their body. So she eats, what does she eat? Fuzzy mice or small mice? Small mice. Small mice now. And Ben eats small rats. So you can see the difference in their, their fat butt size. But Meryl is actually gonna end up being bigger than Ben because she's a girl. So she's not as good with being held and stuff as Ben is just because she's newer and she's younger and she's not as used to it right now. But she'll get better. So rigid. Yeah. <laughs> she's more of what I imagine a normal pool python is in terms of uh, temperament and behavior. Ben's a little bit special. For decorations in hers, she has a skull and a Mega Man helmet. And some nice trees and some little rocks. And she seems to like it in there. She's not as active as Ben is, but like I said, she's still getting used to the whole thing. So yeah, they eat about once a week, but ball pythons are super picky eaters. So if you are looking to not waste a whole lot of money on the frozen thawed rodents, I would probably suggest not getting a ball python. If you don't have the patience to try and make them eat when they don't want to eat, then this isn't a good snake for you because they can be very, very tricky to feed. And that's because they're so docile and they're so passive and they're so, they don't want to just be aggressive and strike at things, which is a great thing, but that does make it harder to feed them. Ben went on a winter fast because that is breeding season for ball pythons. So instead of eating, he just wanted to look for a mate, even though, even though he's still a baby himself and he probably isn't even big enough to have to go and copulate. But <laughs> that's all he wanted to do and he didn't want to eat. And that scared me so bad because I was so worried about him. But as long as they're not losing weight, it doesn't really matter how long they miss out on meals for. But we do have to throw away a lot of frozen thawed rodents that they don't want to eat. And also if you're not okay with feeding rodents to your snake, I know I love rats personally. I had rats as pets, they're fantastic pets. Uh, if you're not okay with feeding your animal what it needs to eat in order to live a healthy life, then you shouldn't get that animal. A snake cannot be vegan, that's just not possible. He can't eat a chicken, like little diced cubed chicken. He needs to eat the entire rat in order to get the nutrients that he needs to live, which is a little bit sad, but it's also the circle of life and it's not like we need to feed him live animals. I wouldn't ever ever recommend feeding live unless it was an absolute last resort. Not only because it's not like nice to see another creature be killed but also because uh, rats are actually powerful animals they have teeth and they have claws and they can really hurt your snake they can claw it and bite it and if you leave even a tiny mouse alone with your snake and your snake isn't hungry and doesn't want to eat it then that mouse can kill your snake and i don't know i think it's, it's not worth risking your snake's life in order to feed live. So I would definitely recommend getting Frozen Thawed. They come in little boxes that you get from the pet store and it's really not that scary <coughs> a process. What else? Oh, where to buy your ball python or your any other snake? I do not recommend getting your snake from a pet store. If you go and look at your local pet store that has snakes and go and look at the snakes that there are there, 
Um, most often they'll be starving, they won't have a hot hide and a cold hide, they won't have hot water and cold water. They will just be in a tiny little place and they will be very unhealthy and it's just then it's not a good snake to buy. Plus it will be overpriced. Pet stores charge so much more than a proper breeder because they have to make a profit. They'll buy it from a proper breeder and then they'll want to make money on top of that. So I do not recommend getting them from a pet store. There are many, many, many good breeders that will give you healthy, stress-free, good, beautiful snakes. I do recommend looking around, reading reviews, making sure it's a nice, proper, well-established breeder and not just a backyard breeder that isn't treating the animals correctly. Ben is from Snakes at Sunset and Meryl, I think maybe Bob Clark Reptiles, I can't really remember. But we looked around not only to find one that was good, but to find morphs that we liked. It's going into my shirt because it's warm. <laughs> if you don't have a place that is local to you where you can get your steak from, you can get it from great distances away with overnight shipping and they can do it really really safely and the snakes are in no possible way harm. Of course there is some level of risk that you might get a, a male worker who just chucks the boxes around and stuff but that is not legal. They're supposed to be treating the boxes with the absolute utmost care possible so so long as people aren't breaking the law and doing their job irresponsibly then your snake should be in perfect health. Oh Meryl right now is going up into the helmet. I've never seen her do that before. <laughs> So, I think that answers all of the questions that you guys have asked me. But if you have any others, feel free to leave them in the comments. If there's anything that I didn't explain properly, feel free to ask it again and I'll try to write it down and explain it better. I just thought that I should make a quick little video about them because they are such amazing, amazing animals. Look how beautiful he is. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. I love ball pythons. But... I've said so much good stuff about them in the past. Why do we need more positivity? <laughs> I don't know. I want to talk about some things that kind of suck about ball pythons. There's really not many. I did my best to compile as many as I could think of, but it's good to make sure we're realistic about both sides of them because obviously not everything is going to be perfect with any interest or hobby. But here are a few things that kind of suck about ball pythons. Firstly, they tend to be known as a pretty picky snake time to time. Uh, it's not every single individual. It's quite a few of them though, and it happens at certain times, and usually this is really no big deal at all. But it tends to scare a lot of people, including me when I got my first ball python, and it's something that a lot of you come to me about. So essentially, they are just fans of going off beat a lot. Most often this happens during breeding season. So in November to February or so, that pretty much lines up with their breeding season. That's also the time that they tend to go off feed the most often. So it is January right now. I'm sure there's quite a few ball pythons out there that are not eating, but it's not something to really be concerned about. It tends to happen more with snakes that are mature enough to breed. And some people say it only happens with females, but my male goes off feed every year and he started doing so when he was like two years old. And this male right here is also not eating. Uh, this is a newer animal that you might have seen on Instagram. And he is actually a bit underweight right now. He was like that before. We still haven't gotten him to eat. I'm sure he will eventually. But that is just something to think about when you're looking at ball pythons. Even if they go off feed in July, there's different processes, processes that you can use to make sure that they really truly don't want to eat, like trying different types of food, different times of the day, different temperatures of the food, different sizes, all sorts of things to actually make sure they genuinely don't want to eat. But sometimes they'll just refuse everything. Maybe it's for a few days or a few weeks or even a number of months. This can cause a decrease in weight Usually they're going to stay quite steady. Mine don't really ever lose weight when they go off feed. They just stop growing for the time being. But even if a couple grams are lost, it's not a huge deal and it can be replenished. It's definitely something to look over, make sure all your husbandry is good and correct. Because sometimes something like an incorrect temperature or humidity or something that might be stressing them out could be the issue. But that's the thing about them. It's a bit unknown as to what exactly is causing it each time it happens but it's not too hard to figure out. Speaking of food, ball pythons are what I consider the biggest beginner snake. Uh, anything larger is probably less of a beginner. It's of course debatable with each one. I'm sure there's some that I'm not thinking of. However, with that said, that means my clock always goes off in every video. 
However, because they get larger, it's essentially guaranteed that they're going to outgrow mice. Uh, so rats, it's usually not a big deal switching over to rats. I've only had to do it a couple times so far. However, my snakes switch from mice to rats without any issues. But there are people that have more trouble because they have different tastes or scents or flavors or whatever. They can be kind of weird about it and might have more trouble. I think it depends on the site. I tend to see rats are more expensive. And you could just start with very small rats from the very beginning. But not many people do that. And it seems like rats are less accessible from what some of you have told me because you might not necessarily be able to find the right sizes. So basically compared to a corn snake, which chances are they're not going to outgrow a jumbo mice, it's possible time to time I usually see adult corn snakes sticking to adults or jumbos. And then even if a corn snake or some other sort of beginner snake did outgrow those a little bit, you could always just feed them slightly more often or feed them more at once. But because bull pythons are definitely going to need those rats, it's possible you could still get by just doing multiple mice. Uh, but generally it seems to be better to just do one large rat. I should a video comparing that. There's still some unknowns, there's still some disagreement with it that you have brought towards me. But you can watch that video on whether you can feed your snake more than one mouse at a time. The third issue you come to me most often about is humidity. I would also say it's probably the most complicated humidity of a beginner snake, maybe? But basically because they like to sit around that 60 to 65% range, maybe a little bit higher while they're shedding, some of you do have trouble doing that because you don't want like a damp enclosure. Now it depends entirely on the climate and what your room is like and what you're heating the enclosure with. I need to do more videos on this, uh, but humidity can be a bit more difficult just because they're prone to stuck sheds if that is off, like a, a hog nose or sambo, they can shed in super low humidity, that's just what they're used to. But a ball python, although they're in a low humidity climate, because they dwell in areas that have higher moisture levels, aka humidity. I'm just trying to say the word humidity. That's something to keep in mind. Again, definitely manageable if you still want the species. And there are plenty of ways to fix this. I talked about this in a video too. I need to update that video though, it's, it's an old one. And ball pythons are a species that you'll see a lot of people keep in tubs and a lot of others keep in aquariums. If you ask me, both work fine. I think it's kind of stupid to say one does not work because there's lots of variables. Like if you're in a very low humidity area, a tub might be ideal for your setup. If you're in really high humidity, maybe it's an aquarium or glass enclosure. Again, that's something we can go more in depth to later, but the humidity is not the most simple thing, but definitely not the biggest deal. So like I said, there's really not that many things, but those are the three biggest issues that I see coming up in the ball python keeping world and that you ask me about. So this is just to kind of help you anticipate those things if you're looking into a ball python. Again, probably my favorite snake to keep. But what are some other issues that you've had with ball pythons? <laughs> it's kind of a weird question, but maybe I'm able to help out with those or find other people that know the answers that can help with those in the future and other videos. But those are the three things that kind of suck about ball pythons. I'll link a bunch of other ball python stuff in the description of this video. Uh, but that should be it for this video. So I'm Alex. I have no idea where the snake is. I don't know if it's still in here. I don't know what type of snake it is. So let's go and have a look. Move some of this stuff around. Whew. Look at that. I mean, look at this back garden. It's just it's strewn with stuff. Could be on anything here. It's a real mess. I'm not going to spend our time looking in the garden, though, because it's really difficult to we're not gonna find anything. We can spend days and not find anything. We're gonna focus in on the house. That's where the builder said it was. So let's focus in on the house, check what we can find. Let's move on. Just watch out there, just hang out there for a bit. And all these big pieces of plastic also. Really, really good for snakes to hide under. And snakes are quite shy and elusive animals, so they don't like being around people. They come in, if they come into a place like this, it's to try and to find shelter away from the elements. They can come some, sometimes come around to this time of the year. It's also really hard though, when you're living, lifting pieces of plastic like this, I mean, the snake could be curled up inside of it. So we don't have a lot of time on our hands. We're just going to look through quite quickly, move on. This for me would be the place, if I was a snake, where I'd be hiding under something like this. It's always important as well, as I stepped here, one of these vines moved. 
what's important is when you're lifting up pieces of iron or this is asbestos, you never lift it this way because if something is under it, you're exposing yourself. So you want to grab it like this, lift it like that, and we've got nothing. A couple of beetles, that's all. Put this back down. Not fortunately in this area of the house, there's not many places where the snake can be hiding. There's some cat food there, but no snake. What people often don't realize is when they see a snake, unless they stand there and watch it, it's actually a really little help to us because the snakes move around so quickly when they want to. You can see a snake here and then if 30 minutes later we arrive, the snake's gone. What we're seeing here is a lot of poo. So it's not rat poo. I, I'm seeing, I don't know if it's bat poo or what it is. Let me just check here. There we go. He has some beautiful bat poo and you can see the little berries in it. That's how I know it's bat poo and not something like rat poo or another small mammal that's going to come in here. So what's happening is bats obviously coming in here at night they're hanging out on these rafters here, roosting. Stop, 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 stop. Right above, just keep still. Right above your head there, you've got snake. You've got mamba there. You've got a green mamba in the roof rafters. Look at that. Oh my gosh. That's what's causing all the commotion. We've got a green mamba in the roof truck on the rafters. And it's obviously coming here can smell bats, incredible sense of smell, and they climb it, so I wasn't even looking up here, in fact we walked right through this room just now, it was above our heads the whole time, and you can see they are absolutely excellent climbers, right on top of the truss, they're trying to double truss, even just hanging out, and it's going to wait there, and it's going to wait for those bats to come back in, it's going to smash those bats, eat the bats, the bats won't even know what hit them, such potent venom, and what we're going to do is, I'm going to talk more about the mama once we get it down, because what I'm worried about, the other reason it's up there, this house is quite cool because it's full of concrete, but up on the roof sheeting, you've got those asbestos sheeting, and that asbestos sheeting is warming up during the day. So although the house here is cold, that's what I thought, for a snake to come in here, it's very unlikely, but hanging out just underneath that warm, it's like a heating pad. And it's thermoregulating right up there in the roof, digesting those bats it's eating. Bats are coming in, getting flattened. This guy, it's in the perfect position of survival. It's hanging out here. It's got free meals coming to it. It's got a beautiful heat pad lying above it. It's living quite a cozy life. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to relocate it, put it back where it's meant to naturally occur, and that's in the bush. We don't want it here. This is a dangerous snake, guys. Very, very dangerous. Now, as you can see, though, the problem is, look how tall these roof rafters are. I can't now go and just grab the snake like this because it's, you can see it tail's wrapped around, it's going to be really, really sore on the snake. So what I'm going to have to do is get some of these blocks here. Guys, if you can keep an eye on the snake, I'm going to get some blocks, pile them up, just give me a little bit more height so I've got more maneuverability as we're trying to grab a snake, Green Mamba, one of my favorite snakes in the world. They're really, really beautiful. Desperate to show it to you properly. Not the safest staircase I've ever made, but nonetheless, we're going to see what we can do. Oh, it's fine, I'm fine. Yeah, it's okay. Right. Now, what I don't want to do is, is get the snake so it drops on my head. That's one thing I'm worried about. It's also, you can see it's already chuck its stock though. It saw us a long time ago. I'm just gonna loosen the tail here a bit. It should start moving forward, but I won't be able to pull it out unless I get this tail out here. Should I start on me? Look at that, it anchors itself with its tail. That's what we want. We can keep it anchored on the pole rather than with the tail. There we go. Look at that tail. And we want to just gently Unloop it. Oh, look at that. It's digging under here as well. You don't want to go into the roof. It gets under that white 
Very alert snakes, always watching us. But look at this guy. Not aggressive snakes, they're quite relaxed. Just to pick up the temperament of this snake. Though. Every snake's got its own individual personality. Let me just see what this snake's doing. They're climbers, as you saw. And that's why what it's going to try to do is going to continue to try and climb either up the pole or on my hand. Look how it's pivoting off my hand chain. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let it try to climb out to our camera we've got there. So, Jock, you just keep really still. I don't want it climbing back on me. I would rather it be climbing back on me. Let's, go, let's just keep that camera still. And we'll start climbing up towards you. It's very important when we're dealing with snakes, guys. You have to learn what comes naturally in snakes. If I drop the stick down like that, it'll start to try and climb up. And now the closest thing for it to climb up to is actually the camera. So if we keep the camera right there, Same family as a black mamba, but half as venomous basically as a black mamba. They also have far more relaxed temperament, so you could never sit like this with a black mamba. Black mamba would be biting you all over the place. Green mamba is far more relaxed. Now. So when a snake is more relaxed, more reluctant to bite. Look at that, got excellent answer. Really, really good. And the reason for that, they live in trees, so they feed primarily on animals and trees, so birds a lot of the time. Some of the rodents that climb trees as well, you need excellent eyesight when you when you're eating prey items like them. Love green mamas. Now some of you might be saying, oh, I had a green mama in my garden. Green mamas only found in the Natal coast of South Africa, within 10 kilometers from the beach. We're only about a kilometer, if that, from the beach today. They're only found really close to the coastline. So if you live in 30 kilometers away, you see a green snake you're gone, it's not going to be a green mamba. I can guarantee you that. Snakes got the reputation of green mamba. One of the ways you can tell this is a green mamba is look underneath these scales. They are always green underneath the green mambas found in South Africa. So you'll see here these green scales and the green coloration underneath. That's how you know green mamba. The other one is so look over here at the head. It's called a coffin shaped head. And look at the long mouth there. It looks like mambas are always smiling. Black and green mambas. Smile like this. And there's actually five different types of mamas in Africa. These are the Eastern Green Mamas found in South Africa. The Black Mamba also found in South Africa. The rest of the mamas, the Jamison Mamas, and the West African Green Mamas are found further north in Africa on the western and east coast as we go further north. One of my favorite snakes, and another thing I'll show you, let's just go out to the sun here a bit. I'm just going to get some better lighting as you can see it. Look at the color of the snake now. Look how it pops. And what we're going to do is I'm going to try to find you some blue scales. If you come right in here close with the camera, the all green mambas have blue and sometimes yellow scales. So although the color is this beautiful green color, you see right there a little bit of kind of a blue blush. Look at that. There's blue blushing over there we've got on the snake. Find some other parts with a bit more prominent. Still on the sides of the snake here, a little bit more blue over here. A little yellow scale. You can see a yellow scale right over here. Very careful to keep my hand away from the body. There's a little yellow scale underneath here as well. There's another yellow scale up on top there. And this snake, enough venom to kill you in about two hours if it was to bite you. A neurotoxic venom attacking your nervous system. So, what will actually happen? Is you'll die of asphyxiation because your diaphragm will become paralyzed. So the, the messages going from your brain down into the muscles are getting stopped at, the, at those senses there. And that's what happens. Your diaphragm stops working, then you eventually die because you can't breathe. And I've spent a few nights in an ICU bed before because of a bite from a green mamba. And it was totally my fault. You can see very reluctant snakes to bite. And the reason for that is that they're just not nervous. They're not sharp. As you see, they come out 
tops of trees, up in the rafters, away from people. They're not there to come and cause fights. They don't normally come into homes at all. And this is obviously the reason it's coming is for bats, not because it wants to hang around with people. You really, if this was in my garden, I'd actually just leave it in the garden. Take care of the rats, one Magnificent snakes. The only time people really do get bitten by these snakes are either handlers or it's people who are picking fruit. Look at them, look at their climbing ability. Climbing right out now to the camera. Look at them. Magnificent. That's what they do. They're just excellent, excellent climbers. Alright, what we're going to do now, guys, we're going to box this snake up, get it somewhere else, go release it where it naturally appears. Slowly, I'm moving with the snake. Really important when you're working with snakes like this, you move slowly so not give them a fright. If they give you a, if you give them a fright, the only thing they can do after that is give you a bite. Yeah. Snake in the box. Let's go drive down the road, not too far. Release it into its natural position. That's where it wants to be. That's where it wants. It's natural. Got to our spot where we're going to release the snake here. Right in some beautiful banana trees. They love banana trees. So let's let it go up here. Let it get on its way. Isn't that amazing? Looking at a snake going into its natural environment. That's what it's about. Releasing green mambas out into the bush again. What a great adventure. And the bush again. See you on the next adventure. <laughs> Guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the awesome videos coming up soon. Beautiful snake. What's up? You checking me out? You just ate recently. I'm gonna fill up the can full of water and we're gonna get Kevin into a nice bath. What is going on, beautiful people? Welcome back to another Chandler's Wildlife. We are here in the snake room. You can hear a cantankerous rattlesnake. You can see the backside of a huge king cobra going into a box. It is crazy. It's a hectic room full of toxic snakes. The best way to see this room is not with this light, but the rest of the light set up. So let's get this off. And there we go. And guys, the first thing I've noticed
Yo, what up, Obi Wan? How you doing, brother? I see you in there. So you, uh, I got this cool pet that's coming in a couple days. I got one of these bad boys. It's been a good long from 10-8. Nice, bro. Good job. Yeah, 10-8. That's a good fucking long right there. Did you buy that, like, insanely fast dip? I know, dude. I'm so pumped on it. I've never had a, a python, dude. I've always kind of wanted one. So this is going to be legit, bro. Maybe I'll even get like a little camera so I can put them on my stream. But he's going he's gonna to be a little baby at first. Do you own any snakes, Obi-Wan? Got in at June twenty fourth, nine forty five. Nice man. What are you gonna do? You gonna keep holding it till we hit twenty k? It's super cheap, dude. I was expecting a lot of money to like get into owning a python, but it's really, it's like a hundred bucks for every all the supplies you need, and then uh, the snake is like you know. Anywhere from a hundred to two hundred bucks. pretty far I think we're gonna well look at this like we have our channel right we've been trading in our channel for a while we kind of just broke it came back down below it now we're gonna retest it I guess if we break above this channel again I'd just hold on to what you got in it. Kind of zoom in a little bit more. You kind of see. I was waiting for this to play out. I made that's where I made three thousand a day. Was on this uh, this bull flag right here. I got in. Um, messed up a little bit. You know, I hit my stop loss and then uh, I rebought it for like three grand profit. But, holy shit, there's a lot of buying, dude. Like, I don't think this is gonna stop. 
I kind of hoped that there would be another, you know, little respite or something. But nope, we're just gonna bug and chug all the way up. Chug, chug, chug. And then a lot of news is coming out for Bitcoin lately. It's all positive. Like, it's just looking really good. Well, good and not good because I want to get more Bitcoin, you know? Yeah. Yeah, if you're holding from 10 8, yeah, that break of the, uh, that bull flag would have been a, another perfect ad there. But hey, you know what? Can't call them all, right? Doesn't matter. You still, you still in profit? Still good? So I've been like watching snake videos all day, <laughs> trying to prep for this uh, this it's animal I've donating. never really never really had before. guy that I'm watching, he has a fucking anna, like a, not only does he have like an anaconda, he has a king cobra, and he has like a collection of rattlesnakes, I'm like, what the fuck, dude? This, and this, this, uh, this king cobra, dude, it's big. It's a big cobra, it's not like it's a small cobra. This thing's like, massive. I don't have really confidence yet, as I just want to make sure my account grows. Yeah, I feel you, man. But then that trade would have really helped. Hey, man. You miss one opportunity, you just, you're more patient, you're, you'll be ready for the next one. In the meantime, look at this guy's King Cobra, bro. And these snakes are like aggressive too. Like this thing charges them. You coming to get the blood? Yeah, use the zoom on that camera. Stay way over there. Cause he is getting ready to charge. Oh, dude, look at that thing. He's pissed. He's posturing. He's seeing what's going on. Oh, fuck that, dude. <laughs> Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You have to, like, stand up to it and crap. Uh-uh, I'd be, like, crying, dude. This thing's gonna freaking kill you. Yeah. All it has to do is bite you right. once and you're dead in, like, ten so minutes. Here we go. Not exactly how I plan to do it. But it works for me. So this box is locked up. And what I'll do is bring the main Absolutely box ridiculous, right to the floor where you're standing at <laughs> I designed this box myself. The design was inspired by much older Cobra Keepers over the years. This thing's, 
Actually, here, I want you to see how big it is. He takes it out. No, yeah, look at this. This King Cobra is, it is a beast of a What? <laughs> on a healthy diet. Now, I've watched Discovery Channel before, and they haven't been that big. Look at this thing. This King Cobra is a Malaysian King Cobra. So, a python is a great source of food for this animal to eat. All right, guys, I'm going to put Kevin right in there. There we go. Come on, get a good look at him. He's in the water now. He's going to... Oh, watch out, watch out. Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, just one bite and it's cheers, mate. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna leave him in there for about thirty to forty minutes, nice and soaked and hydrated, and bring him back out, bring him back in his enclosure. I want to change these papers inside his box because you can see he's been pooping inside here. But yeah, dude, that's that's crazy. Jesus, are we gonna go higher here? Are we gonna just gonna wheat right through here? Is that what we're gonna do? It's right at that resistance level. It's thinking about it. It's like, hmm, do I wanna? Hmm. I haven't even looked at the daily, dude. Uh, I'll have to check that today. Take a look see real quick. Dude, this is insane. Like, I... Ah! You know, we're just gonna... I wish I bought more at 3K. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just sitting here, I'm like... I don't know why I was thinking it could go lower. I just was. I should have bought more. But look at that fucking move, bro. Oh my god. Remember when they said Bitcoin was dead? Jesus. What is this at? We're up like 200% this year. Another parabolic move, maybe? Still long from 700? <laughs> Fuck you, bro. <laughs> ah, I'm getting a phone call one sec.
Of course I get a phone call right as this is happening, right? She's trying. I don't know if we got it in or though. I was late on that entry, so I feel sweaty right now, you know? That's two, that's like four million sold off right there. I don't know, it's kind of worrisome. Honestly, I might end up just closing here. I'm gonna close with a couple hundo profit and that's it. Oh, as soon as I close, there's $3 million buy. Hello, buddy. What's happening? Where were you 10 seconds ago? I guess you're right. I've been kind of taking it easy for the past couple days after hitting my uh, my first goal. Playing some video games and just relaxing. So, I'm trying to get back into the swing of things and, and start making that, those 10k days, you know.
All my stuff's getting shipped out as we speak. Yeah, brother. I'm gonna get all my stuff tomorrow, it looks like. Uh, what am I playing? Oh, I dig, like, uh, Daisy. I've been playing some World War Three recently. Uh, PUBG. I, I mean, I, I think I have Apex. Pretty sure I do. I don't know if I have to download it, though. I like, I like Apex. It's alright. I just, I'm more of like a, an old school FPS kind of hardcore kind of guy. So I like, uh, oh, let's see. PUBG, Arma 3, Daisy. You haven't played PUBG in, in a long time? Yeah, I, I went back, like, the other day and played a little bit of it. It seemed alright. It's still the same game. Apex is definitely faster paced. I like that. I wish, okay, if PUBG had like, like a faster lobby system, then I think it could compete. Yeah, dude, when Halo comes out for PC, I'm gonna get it for sure. I still remember fucking playing Halo 2 on the Xbox original. Dude, the old MLG videos. They all started with the same beginning music. The same shitty animated YouTube channel name. Those are the good old days, man. That's when, back when YouTube, you know, would, uh, wouldn't censor anything. So you could look up a bunch of, like, Halo glitches or whatever. Sports on it. I just kind of played it to play it, but those were some real nerds, man. The real boys.
Oh, that, sp that split screen life, dude? Oh, yeah. That was the best. Have a bunch of your friends over. Eat a bunch of junk, junk food. Drink a bunch of soda. Oh my gosh, I think, uh, I think my snake's coming tomorrow, bro. I hope it doesn't come before all of the, the cage supplies, dude. <laughs> I just have a python sitting out, waiting for all of his cage. Oh my god, that'd be so terrible. We had LAN weekends, ethernets all over the house. Oh, dude, yeah. Remember when you could just plug your uh, your Xbox into it to another Xbox via like a Cat Five cable? What they call that ad hoc or some shit? I don't remember. Well, if you never stream again, I know it ain't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude, this is bad because the 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 snake's tank doesn't come till Thursday, <laughs> the day after it's supposed to get here. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep it in a box. That'll work, right? I think if I get eaten by my baby python, I deserve to die, personally. Yeah, I'll just use a box <laughs> until until the next day when my my aquarium arrives. My, or terrarium, or I think is the the proper word for it, terrarium or something. Dude, I'm so I'm so excited to get this snake because I've wanted a snake since I was a kid. I'm also kind of like scared of snakes as well, so it's kind of a love hate relationship. It's very confusing. Three million dollars purchase right there. I uh, went ahead and bought right there.
looks like that might have been a bad idea. Ah, uh, not too bad of an idea. That's pretty good. Oh man, it is. There's a lot of compression here, though. Man, liquidate those short shorts, boy. Yeah. I'm gonna take that thousand dollars and run. Run with it. That tiny ass little break of pattern there. Previous resistance, right there. Probably still gonna go up from here. Like, damn! Yes, sir. Higher highs. Higher lows. Also, like, look at this. This is a good buy. These highlighted green parts are actually surprisingly, like, accurate right here. We might just go to 12k by the end of tonight.
answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. All ball python morphs they originate to the normal or the wild type ball python. That means that every single morph that we see comes from the normal ball python. That's because the spider, the pastel, and the like Oreo BPI accentual polypro bumblebee. All of these different morphs they are genetic mutations which of course started as the normal or the wild type. One of these mutations was named the spider gene. If I remember correctly, it was developed back in 1999. So it's actually not that old. It is one of the first genes to be made and it's also one of the most used genes in morph, which means that not only the single gene spider is used, but you will also see the spider gene in a lot of variation of morphs. For example, Oreo, my BPI Accenture Calico Bumblebee, he actually has the spider gene in it. Often when people are selling both Python that have Ooh, selling off real quick though, like damn boy. something specific. So if you are in doubt that a specific type of move has the spider gene in them, I have linked to a website. What are we gonna like are we gonna bounce off this uh I remember falling in love with this trend line right here? It kind of looks like it. Took a position at the bottom of that red candle. I didn't really execute where I wanted it to though. I'm gonna sell it there too, take 1400. What can you say? Turn yourself upside down. The intensity of this wobble may vary from snake to snake. Some spiders don't really have any wobble at all, or very, very little of it, whereas others really have a lot of it and it, it can be quite severe, even causing the snake having some trouble to eat. But speaking of eating in general, snakes with the spider gene are known to be very, very good eaters. And I can certainly check that off on my list with Oreo. He's a very, very good eater. Like me, you may also ask, how does this wobble affect my snake? Like I talked about before, it doesn't really affect their capability of eating. They are very good eaters, but they may have some trouble when striking. Also, you won't have to do anything extra or anything specific to take care of a bull python with the spider gene. It's just the same as every other bull python when it comes to care. Of course, it might be worrying to see your snake shaking and having trouble climbing and all that kind of stuff. I know it breaks my heart a little bit when I see Oreo with his head upside down or in a weird position. But talking health-wise, if we are talking eating, pooping and shedding, the snake will function just as well. The issue with the spider bee, I think, is the ethical discussion whether or not it is appropriate to breed on this gene because it has these neurological defects. I have talked to some breeders and more and more breeders are stopping to breed on this because the neurological issue simply becomes too severe and many think it's not ethical to breed a snake that has these issues. There is also the IBD with growers that may also cause them to turn their heads upside down and even just stare right up. So unfortunately neurological diseases are more and more known with snakes and of course the more that we uh, inbreed Weird. So py there's a certain genome of pythons that have like neurological issues and they like hold their heads sideways and shit. <laughs> they can't like look straight up and down, you know? That's funny. Here's the thing, so this snake carries multiple genes, well so the more genes you cram into something, the higher likely you are going to have an issue. you got at least one pastel copy, one spider copy, and it's got the clown, right? Uh, other than hissing at me and wanting me to die, it's doing well, it's moving fine, it's tongue flick is good, it's body condition is good, it has even four just my slowest feet. <laughs> I love when they do that. Alright girl, I'll put you back. You can see it's doing good. Now, I'm not going to try to roll her over and roll with some, but because she's already hissing and stressed, I do believe stress, especially prolonged stress over time, or too high of heat, will lead to making things worse. Okay? So 
so if you have one that's really bad, and it wasn't bad to begin with, people are like, oh, it just happens. My ass. I've had spiders since I started. I've never had one just start becoming a really bad wobbler. It's in their husband. That's my guess. Uh, now, again, can I prove that? No, I can't. I can't. Spiders off the ground, they typically have a little bit of an issue. That floppy thing looks like banging his head and busting his face all over that people like to show or crawling upside down. Again, stress-induced. She's about to be stress-induced because she's thinking of lighting somebody up. But uh, even if she stresses, she's not going to do that because she's not living in a constant state of fear and stress. All right, girl, we'll put you back up. <laughs> up to my favorite one. He gets handled all the time. Because this is one of my favorite snakes. I've never used it. Of course you guys know him. That's Zeus. And again, this is a multi-gene animal. We're talking a pastel spider exanthic SK line. Look he's and they're so they're they're like so calm as well. Like their their natural defense against predators is just to basically like roll up into a ball. That's why they're called ball pythons. So sick, man. Tell me what a spider does. Now that he's hidden like this, and I flip him over, he probably won't roll back over right away. Because he's hiding his head. See? He flips over just fine. He no just issue when he decides to. Goes into a little ball just and like hides. Not an issue. Doing great. Cruising around. Doesn't really like being rolled over. Not used to being out and running around free. But I don't see any issue. Man, look how pretty, pretty that exactly. snake is. Well, we'll show some straight, just plain spiders, but it changes the pattern. So you get that really cool barbed wire pattern. Now, we purposely breed that to be more reduced. That's my, there's a little bit of spider wobble there, too, because his head's up off the ground being held. They have a hard time finding that down. Now, when their head's on the ground, look, instantaneously perfect. No issues. What's up, cow dog? These are not tree snakes, okay? It's not going to bother them in life. As a matter of fact, the first spider was found by an imported by nerd. Nerd didn't find it, they just imported it. It wasn't a bone, that's what I understand. Nerd can correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I know it was surviving in the wild. It wasn't hatched on the It was like a tree So, you know, ball pythons in general have a tough time doing that. Uh, this one did sample. Out of the hundreds of thousands out of there, even five or ten examples. But it's funny, I can go through here. I can't show you one in my collection, can I? Interesting. Interesting fact. Let me get this baby. Okay, well this is uh, one of our ball pythons, Cleopatra. Uh, a little smaller than she should be. She went off school for about seven weeks, and uh, she had, she was basically one of the hardest struggles we had. Never really saw. She wasn't messing around. Still. Oh yeah, what's that? Oh, <laughs> yep, sick as hell, did. dude. Oh, I can't wait to do that. It's very, very odd how they do this and see how fast that went to work. But I um, wasn't told that he had it. And it's not that it's really a big issue, but when I first saw what he was doing, I was freaking out. Um, because basically it is like a defective gene the spider carries. Um, and from what I've looked up, I was doing a bunch of research, is that pretty much all spiders uh, show some sign of this. Um, so it is like a defective. And from what I've seen, it's not like See, it like it's rolls like, over? That's weird. It's not like the worst case. Oh but my gosh! Um, I've been reading up a lot for the last little while on this. And the uh, only thing that I had a problem with it, um, that I didn't know at the time, I wasn't told that he had it. His head, basically. He's a wicked snake. Um, never any problem with eating. Whether he strikes or not, he always eats it anyways, but I don't believe it in, or if he strikes at it, which he has several times. He, uh, 
And if you go through and look, basically ask how many morphs come from this guy, that means they let me know like, what it was, do my own research, and came up with it wasn't really that, that bad of an issue. Um, some Reminds me of uh, when I had to feed my mate Snake when he was away on holiday. Dude, it's so cool. I love this shit. Come on, buddy. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's getting ready. Oh, it's getting ready. You're about to die, little rat. Oh! Oh, yeah! Did you know that feeding them live is elite? Are you fucking serious? Really? A freaking mouse? Y'all just need to calm down over there. Stop worrying about feelings and shit. <laughs> Jeez. Squeezing the hell out of that thing. Almost no too low. Yeah, it's crazy. It's so they don't get used for live food. Wait, why not though? Like, they get used as live food in the wild, like, it's just a mouse. You walk out, when you mow your lawn, like, you probably kill a few, you know? I think it's just people are oversensitive and they shouldn't be making the governmental laws. No person, no person that can't handle a mouse dying should be handling legislative duties, like, <laughs> in my opinion. I was telling you about. He's got all these poisonous snakes, dude. He has to get special licenses for these and stuff. If he will enjoy this nice, oh yeah, oh yeah, look at this snake. Oh, he's gonna come up. He's gonna come up. He's gonna come up. Oh. Dude, look at them drink. Oh, it's so weird. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Chandler's Wildlife. This is a to this content click away or just let it play and walk out of the room so I still get that ad money so we have right here defrosted rodents we're gonna be feeding all the snakes and we have some new snakes in the snake room that you guys haven't seen yet so it's gonna be real fun and we have new setups look at this look it's all lit up it's like this. bro you can see you can hear all the rattlesnakes rattling in the background he has so many of them we're gonna add some more to the environment plants and whatnot uh, down here is a cane break rattlesnake it is a beautiful specimen. And then down here we have Mojave rattlesnakes. Super toxic. Whew, cool stuff. Now let's start feeding some snakes. 
All right, guys, come close. We're going to be feeding the Rhino Viper right here. This is my Rhino Viper. And he's about a year and a half old. Going on two. Let's see, we're going to offer him. Let's see. This rat crawler. This should be good. Let's see that arrow. Shoot! Oh, Ooh. look at that. That strike, though. What an impressive animal. All right, here we are with the puff adders in their new enclosure. Like I said, we're going to add some stuff. Rocks. I'll crop to hide. What I need to do is put one puff adder on the far side of the enclosure so they're not right next to each other when they feed. Because we don't want that. So let me move this guy over here. There we go. Have a rat crawler. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ooh. Always ready to eat. Look how cool that is. What's up, dude? Happy Thanksgiving. He's switching his snakes. Happy Thanksgiving, dude. Right this there. guy is crazy. <laughs> Alright, now I'm going to feed the other one. Just past Mr. Bitey right here. Okay, he's going to back up because he's going to be near me. There we go. Good thing I have these nice long tongs. There we go. Good snake. I gotta figure out what I'm gonna Look name my at snake. the killer colors of this snake. How amazing. Look at that. Beautiful, vibrant yellow. Ooh. Oh. And these snakes know Fuck it's that. time. They start to get a lot more active. They flick their toe a lot. Take them here. Oh. That's the initial bite that a rattlesnake will do once it wants to kill the prey, and then it waits for it to die, follows the scent trail, and then consumes the food. So we're going to leave her be. Yo, this is wild. It's like having Discovery Network in your house. This is the weirdest thing, is when they drink. They look like, they look crazy. They look, ugh. Now for the Mojave rattlesnakes, we don't have the right size rodents. So we're gonna wait to feed them. We're actually gonna feed them tomorrow instead. Too bad you guys won't get to see that, but we have plenty of cool rattlesnakes to be feeding right now. All right guys, come check this out. We had moved all the snakes around. As you saw over there, the puff adders are now in their new vision cage. Because here, we have an awesome, Beautiful baby Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. Look how beautiful that snake is. Now, I'm not huge into morphs, but we'll pick this up from a guy who bred albino Eastern Diamondbacks. And then in that brood of babies, albino Diamondbacks came out and also some normal looking ones. Those are called Hector albinos. And I know, right? The way they eat is um, the all in one thing, I get it. This is a hit for albino eastern diamondback rattlesnake, a gorgeous snake. Now, like I said before, I'm not too big into morphs, but I gotta say, eastern diamondbacks that are albino are not too common like it is with the western diamondbacks, and I think I might have to get a young albino diamondback rattlesnake baby. What do you think, Will? Should I do it? Why? Brent? All right, guys, next one we're gonna... I, I feel like we're being watched right now. <laughs> All right, guys, we are gonna be feeding the Mexican West Coast rattlesnakes. They're right here, they're beautiful snakes. What I'm gonna do to keep myself safe is put the tongues where I'm holding them above. The opening, I'm not going to protect it. Let me just close it up a bit. Oh, wow. Oh, good eaters. Let me help you out with the best side. Right here, we have one of the smaller rats. We're going to be feeding it to this albino 
Let's model for Cobra. Here we oh. go. Oh, oh whoa. Hey, you want it? Ooh, such an aggressive eater. Look at that beautiful snake. Just chill in there. <laughs> That's a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> we have another Cobra right in this box. Hiding, but uh, how many I'm cobras sure does this guy be... have? For God's sake, let's see if we take down a nice little snack. Hey, sweetie. No, nope, no, happy Thanksgiving. I want to read you a poem. Oh, 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 roses are red, uh, violets are blue. I'm bleeding a lot. <laughs> That's not a good rhyme. That's good. Okay, now we have a very hungry western diamondback rattlesnake. Now you can see this snake in the video where we do venom versus blood, so it shows you how potent the Whoa. What's happening? Bunch of chop. Some big buys though. So that was the, the initial bite. There we go. He's gonna feed on that right when I look away. All right, guys, we're gonna be. Oh, whoa! She is ready to eat. That is Pinky, the Gaboon Viper, and she is ready to eat. We just crack this open. There we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, ho, there we go. The Gaboon Viper. Look at that. You see how she raised her body up. What the Gaboon Viper will do out in the wild is when they capture a rat, they sink their fangs into the chest cavity, delivering the venom, but to keep the animal from kicking off the ground to push the snake while he eats, he brings his head up, so he grabs it and holds it up in the air like a dinosaur. It's crazy. That's why Gaboon Vipers are so cool. They have such a unique Jesus. hunting technique. Look at that. Also, the colors are magnificent. I'm just going to gently push her back a little bit. I'm gonna take a bye there real quick. Okay, let me get ready for this guy. He's a little... As you can see right here, there's a lot of buys coming in. It looks like we might try to break previous highs here. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Let's break over previous highs now. Come on, baby. It's trying. We're buying this this level here like I don't see why we can't go higher
So we came down, now we're coming back up, testing previous highs. If we, break, if we don't break here, it's probably going to just go back down. Still liquidating some shorts, that's good. Closing it. Fifteen minutes till the daily close. Now, this is what I don't get. Why doesn't it show my, uh, my candle thing here? It's supposed to tell me, right? Yeah, because it shows me right here when the candle's going to close, but it doesn't show me on the daily for some reason. Am I missing something? Just moves so, though, dude. It's been nothing but fucking good setups on this stream for the past two weeks. Yours does that too? Yeah, that's weird, man. I don't know. Hey, uh, I'm gonna be your back. Give me like one minute.
All right, I'm back. It's way up north. Hey, Bear. Uh, What's up, Bear? Not much. I'm getting a snake, bro. You're getting a snake? Python, yeah. Okay. A ball python? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a spider by ball python. I had a Mojave fire. Oh, really? Yeah. I almost got a coral glow, but they were out of them. But I'll get that. That'll be my next one. Do you have a setup for them? Yeah. Don't get a glass tank. <laughs> Why? Because they require high heat and humidity, and glass tanks don't do that. <laughs> well, what does? Plastic. Yeah. You can buy a plastic vivarium pre-built. You can buy one that you have to assemble yourself. Or what I did for like the first year, I just put them in a, like a plastic like storage tub, and that actually works really well. Uh, you can use a tank, but you, you'll just be like spraying it every day. I don't like, I don't like spraying all the time. Well, how did you heat it? The light? What? No, you put a ceramic heater over the lid. Okay, okay, so like the one I got now, I bought a nice one. It's like plastic, like quarter inch uh, PVC plastic, and it's got like sliding glass doors. And I screwed in a radiant heat panel on the inside. It's like a flat disc. Yeah, I've got one of those. Yeah, but when I had the plastic tub, I just hung up a uh, ceramic heat emitter, and it's not—it's like a light bulb with no light. Yeah, and I know. It, I uh, think I'm just gonna use a heating pad under the, the substrate, and I then added that to it. I'll have a, a hidey hole for him. I think I might get like a lamp too, so he can bask. Oh, don't put it in the substrate though. I'm shorting here, Jacoby, right now. Yeah, Dizzy, I'm getting 306.8 pulse for the first turn. What era are you in? I'm in the modern era. Okay. And then, uh, then my production, my capital of Berlin, I built, uh, the Ruhr Industrial Valley, I'm getting like 128.8 production. I can build like, I can build the Statue of Liberty in 15 turns if I wanted to. Hey Dizzy, guess what you're I'm um, in. Guess what I'm in? What? Guess what you're uh, I'm in. I don't know. I'm in the Holocaust era. <laughs> <laughs> Doing pretty bad. I heard they have good bakers. Yeah, yeah my, my, my Germans will cook you up real nice. Alright, server's back up. I had to do a win I had to do a update. Windows update, but everything's back up and running. And uh, I've already tested all the changes and it looks good. Alright, good deal. So so bear, um I added a bridge to the, uh, the castle island and a bridge to the prison island. And oh, I moved tight. the black market trader to the one on the castle island. And um, I moved the drug dealer 
far, far up north into a little area that I built and put a I've also put a munchie dealer in there with him. So it sells like <laughs> And I've also added a smoke shop in the drug dealer, so you can buy like uh, cigarettes and pipes and cigars and oh, Zippo dude, lighter, no. which the Zippo lighter is really cool. It is works it as really? a light source. Yeah. Works as a like it. Yeah, and it works as a light source, and um, it also works to start fires. That's dope, dude. What the fuck? Do what? I said that's dope. I think I'm about done making changes to it. I think I got everything I really wanted. I couldn't find any. I wanted a unique vehicle game. I couldn't like find any. Yeah, they're not made yet. Fuck. There's no mods for that. Someone is making one for a uh, Dodge Challenger, though. Oh, dude, that would be so sick. Like a new yeah, one or if, the old uh, one? I think it's the new one. But if. Uh, like a Hellcat if, or. I don't know. When they finish it, uh, right now it's still it's still being designed. But when they finish it, um, I'll probably put a, a specialty dealer somewhere in the, hidden in the game where you have to find them to get that car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like oh, an Easter yeah. egg. Yeah. I'm thinking about putting a bunch of different Easter eggs in the game. You should have somewhere it's a random building. Mm -hmm. A little note that says "fuck you, ninja." <laughs> so everything. Um, I verified. Ooh, there's that new, shorts there's new, working out. There's new food in the game, new backpacks in the game, new clothing in the game, Ooh. new tools. Oh, I added a katana and a uh, um, a scythe to the game too. Sweet. Oh, and it works. I'm gonna close it there at seventeen hundred dollars profit. You should have like a futuristic laser gun. Or like there's only one of them and it's hidden somewhere. Oh, and I also added a bunch of John Lennon glasses. John Lennon glasses? <laughs> yeah, they're little round, the round sunglasses. Nice. Different colored lenses. And a bunch of masks too, like uh, the clown mask, the Hannibal Lecter mask, uh, three different gas masks, and a straw hat. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Jacoby. Yeah, that was a good short there. I, for a second, I didn't think it was going to come back down, but we rejected off that, uh, off this, this top right here, and I just felt confident enough to hold it. Right as I sold off, you saw those buys coming in, though? That was, that was good timing. That was good timing. Cade, run, he's streaming. <laughs> no, you got a little quiet. They're gonna oh, find, man. They're gonna, they're gonna find out where he hides all those bodies, bro. You can't smoke a joint and wear the mask at the same time. You can't find them if you melted them all down and flush them down the toilet. Wait, does it actually affect you, though? There's a big I, buy. I honestly don't know. I haven't noticed any effects. You haven't noticed anything. But it does, sm <laughs> it does produce a lot of smoke. So it might give away your position if you do, if you have one in your mouth while you're in combat. It's a good channel we're trading in right now. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, you mean this one right here? Because we kind of broke out of this. Can you add vapes, uh, Gus? Is that is that a mod? Mm, there wasn't any. It's vapes, cigarettes. I mean, not vapes. <laughs> joints, <laughs> joints, cigarettes, um, cigars, and a Sherlock Holmes pipe. <laughs> So there's no like meme mods. Not that I found. <laughs> like you can't play as Thomas the Trank Engine or anything. Da, 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 da. Wait, Dizzy, was it you that I was playing World War Three with? No, 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 that was somebody else. No. Hey, hey, where do I look at this? I got three pre-dreadnought battle cruisers in your area. I think we might. I think Doobie and I might go play some Rainbow Six. You guys want to join? I don't have it. I don't have it either. How are you? How do you got that so fast? I'm getting 216.2 science per turn. Oh yeah. How do you do that? Oh, you mean this right here, Jacoby? This I build thing? tons of campuses. Yeah, ninja or uh, cave. That's what I learned to do. 
What? Really build those. Oh, build uh, the the dreadnought type ships. No, uh, campus is early. Oh yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I mean, it's still looking toppy here, Jacoby. So you could short it again, technically, if it breaks below that lower uh, green. If you're going for like a high money run early, you want to go a little bit culture. Otherwise, buy the break at the previous time. Yeah. Um. Alright, so Dizzy, uh, I hate to leave you not doing anything. Uh, I'll, you play I'll play a single. I'll play a Okay. Oh, my, I mean, I, sometime tonight I still want to give you that 40 bucks that I owe you. Alright, uh, I'm heading out, guys. I'm fine. See ya. Alright, see you, bear. Dude, this this was savage, Jacoby. This move right here was savage last night. Oh, that was bad, dude. I just know so many people got liquidated right there, dude. Real test now that VWAP moved up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude, that was a savage retest. I wish I could have been awake for that and bought that. <laughs> that was so fast, dude. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. My YouTube uh, channel has 12 subscribers now. Wow. I made it. Yeah, you weren't watching it either. <laughs> Damn it. Well, you can't be on 24-7. You gotta sleep, so... of you have been asking for so in this video i'm going to try my best to answer an important question which is this what if what we're seeing on the chart of bitcoin is not what everybody thinks this is in other words what if this is not a bull market in bitcoin and what if bitcoin has not actually bought now before i start this video let me just mention this quickly 
I've already made two separate videos stating the bullish case for Bitcoin. So in two separate videos, I've already addressed the question that if Bitcoin has bottomed, what could potentially happen next? So in that video, I covered the bullish case for Bitcoin and said if Bitcoin has actually bottomed, then we could be starting a five wave move towards the 30,000 and 50,000 levels on Bitcoin. Now, in this video, we're going to look at Bitcoin from the opposite point of view. In other words, what if what we're seeing right now on the chart of Bitcoin is not what everybody thinks it is? In other words, what if what we're seeing right now on Bitcoin is not actually a bull market? And what if it's not actually bottom? Now, I'm sure there's oh, people like who are watching video? this video I'm pretty right sure now. you're the one that led me on to this That guy, is ridiculous. Actually. Of course Bitcoin has bottomed. Just look at it. This is a definite bull market. It just looks like a bull market, right? I mean, what else is this? What else is this parabolic move in Bitcoin if it's not a bull market? Now, let me just say this. I do sympathize with that point of view. I have to say, when you look at a chart like this of Bitcoin, it does appear to be like a major bull market and a major uptrend that could take us towards the 20,000 and 30,000 and potentially 50,000 levels. However, as many professional traders and analysts will know, just because the charts may look like they're showing a bull market, it does not necessarily mean that it is. So while I realize that what I'm going to argue in this video may not be easy, however, it's important to consider Bitcoin from every angle. As I'm sure you will agree, it's important to look at the market from every possible angle so we can be better prepared. Therefore, in this video, I'm going to show you three pieces of evidence as to why Bitcoin may not actually have bought. All right, guys, let's start with reason number one, extreme sentiment. Now, as I'm sure you already know, the sentiment readings on Bitcoin are off the charts. For example, according to a recent report from Jason Geffer, who looks at market sentiment, and sentiment, as I'm sure you probably know, is how optimistic or pessimistic people are in general regarding to Bitcoin. And right now, according to sentiment readings from Jason Geffert, we are at extreme 2017 levels. In other yeah. words, extreme 2017 See, that makes sense. of sentiment or bullishness in Bitcoin. And right now, according to sentiment readings from Jason Geffert, we are at extreme sentiment readings. Not You know, that kind of makes sense though. Like, kind of like, you know, take it all the way up to 20K, drop it down to 3K and fake a bull run juke everybody out short them down to what three thousand six thousand again i mean that would make sense from from like the the bank's perspective the institutional like perspective because they still have they don't want to buy a ten thousand dollar bitcoin do they they still haven't re regulated it they still haven't made an etf for it that would mean that big money still hasn't entered, right? Besides for a select few. Alright, let's keep watching. Not seen since December 2017. This will come as no surprise to anybody because you only- Dude, if it goes to 1k again- <laughs> I don't know, man. That's, that's scary. If it goes back to 1k- <sighs> People are going to get wrecked. I wonder, what was the, what was the tech bubble retracement? Yeah, well, it's it's honestly probably more probable because, you know, they they don't want to buy like even if I if I was a big trader like them, I wouldn't want to buy Bitcoin when it's eleven thousand. I'm a small trader and I don't want to buy, you know, Bitcoin at eleven thousand. I want to buy it cheaper right now. And and you know you know that the big boys love shakeouts. You know they love shakeouts. It sounds like something they would just do, just to fuck with people.
Thanks to for this information, give what follows. Your most brilliant Bitcoin is rallied nearly three thousand dollars in the past week. Woo! Damn, dude. Yeah, that's a good point right there. This whole time our price has been going up, but our longs have been liquidated. Yeah, that does sketch me out. That really does. That means we're hitting some pretty nice walls. We have to read some of the comments in social media to see what people are saying about this. True that, dude. Just read Nobody knows. Here's one comment here. Bitcoin has certainly bought it. You will never Basically, nobody knows anything, so any kind of, like, long-term fundamental analysis is kind of, you know, just kind of bullshit, because nobody really knows what's happening. The only thing you can do is basically pick a direction where you think it's going to go, and then enter the market in, in really highly probable places, and, and then just set your stops and forget about it. Uh, I have a hard time setting my stops and forgetting about it because I like to watch Hello, it. Hello, everybody. So, I don't really look at the long-term kind of stuff that much, but I do keep in touch with it for sure. Probably not as much as I should have, though. Looks like we got some buying coming in right now. Jesus. I went ahead and bought there because that's an insane amount of buys coming in there. I don't know if you can hear that, but that's... Jesus. Oh, that's too loud. See, I like getting in and I like getting out fast with as much profits as possible. Your Discord earlier was a touch too loud though. Sell it there for a thousand dollars profit. You know, this is what I'm thinking. So I'm good at the scalping and the short term type of stuff. And I think you're you're better. It sounds like from more of like a swing trader's perspective because you were holding that 10-8 position. So this is what I've been kind of mulling around in my head. In order to get better at the, the long-term stuff, I've been thinking about, um, I, I don't know if I can do this, but like create two different like accounts and then one's gonna be my fast and one's gonna be my long play.
See, that's good, yeah. And I, I believe Dairybit even has uh, the ability to make sub-accounts within your own account. So you don't even have to make another account, you just use both. Yo, and scrupulous. Thanks for the follow, man. Uh, I don't know why my uh, my notification didn't pop up. Maybe I'm just being too fast. But welcome, brother. Thank you for that follow. Yeah, it's working. I don't know. Maybe. Weird. Maybe stream elements is like way ahead of uh, the other one. Welcome back for ever be able to buy Bitcoin under 3200 ever again folks. We're headed to a market cap of 1 trillion. Here's another one. 58k? Not impossible, but I don't believe it. Here's another one. You will buy Bitcoins over 20k or wait forever. Good luck. And there's another one for you. Of course, there is no certainty regarding anything in the markets. The probabilities are overwhelming that we have bought it. And most analysts that I know have already or are coming around to this. By the way, he's right about that. The great majority of analysts and people who write articles seem to be of the opinion that Bitcoin has definitely bottomed. So bottom line is this, guys. A lot of people write... Yeah, dude, don't go with the crowd. You're going to get wrecked. Right now, seem to be extremely bullish. And here's one thing you should remember. Jim Rogers, one of the greatest gold investors of all time, warned about the dangers of the majority opinion. Listen to this. Maybe what I've learned in my life is normally when everybody's thinking the same way, you should start at least thinking, hey, wait a minute, it cannot be right if everybody's thinking the same way. And it nearly always is that when everybody's thinking the same way, somebody's not thinking, and you should at least examine the other side. So guys, as you heard there, Jim Rogers was warning that when everybody's thinking the same thing, we should probably take a look at the other side as well. In other words, given the fact that so many people right now are so extremely bullish on Bitcoin, we should at the very least start questioning this majority view because the majority could be wrong as well. All right, guys, let's go to reason number two. Another major reason as to why Bitcoin is not a bottom is because of the speed of the current move in Bitcoin. Take a look at this, guys, and notice how extremely fast and parabolic this move in Bitcoin has become. A lot of people are saying right now, well, this is just a normal bull market. They are wrong, and I'll show you why. By the way, notice that on Bitcoin, this is a monthly chart of Bitcoin, we're Woo! almost at the 50% retracement. Jesus. And not too far away from the 61.8% retracement either, which are about the 11,400 to 13,000 levels. In other words, guys, in just a few months, we have almost retraced 50% of the previous decline in Bitcoin. Now, why is that something to be concerned about? Here's why. Look at the previous Bitcoin bull market rally from 2015 to 2017. So this was when Bitcoin bottomed in 2015, and that was the highs, the peak we made near 20,000 in 2017. Now, take a look at this, and you tell me if this looks like anything we're looking at right now on Bitcoin. This is the weekly chart, by the way. I think you'll agree with me. This looks nothing like what we're looking at right now on Bitcoin. Here's why. Number one, 
Look how long it took from the previous bottom, in the previous crash and the previous bear market of Bitcoin. When Bitcoin bottomed in 2015, look how long it took for it to actually recover 50% of its previous decline. It took a year and a half. A yeah, so, I mean, either way, we could be going up super fast because we're going parabolic now. Like, now we're actually starting to get adoption. But I think you're right. I think it might be too early. Too fast, too early. I definitely see where you're getting that point of view from. A year and a half before it could retrace 50% of its previous decline. This time around, it's taken almost six months. Something is not quite right here. That's not all. Let's go to this next chart over here. In the previous bull market rally that occurred between 2015-2017, notice, first of all, we had two failed rallies. This is what normally happens in a bull market. At the start of every bull market, in a healthy bull market, usually we get failed rallies, meaning rallies that don't end up anywhere. Plus, notice in the bull market from 2015-2017, you will see how many times Bitcoin came back to test its 21 weekly average. This is what happens in a healthy bull market. In a healthy bull market, you see a steady and measured upward trend. In other words, a staircase pattern. You will see the market goes up, okay, pull back to the 21 weekly average, and then goes up, pulls back to the 21 weekly average, and so on and so on. You'll see several pullbacks to the 21 weekly average as the market moves higher. By the way, notice something else in the previous bull market. Notice that during these pullbacks, at no time did Bitcoin fall below its 21 weekly average. In every pullback, it protected and stayed above. It closed above the 21 weekly average. That is also something you see in a healthy bull market. And again, guys, as I mentioned before, you only have to take a look at the chart of Bitcoin right now and look at it. Not a single pullback so far. Not a single pullback to the 21 weekly average. We have yet to test this moving average. We have not done that. Yet. Now, it's possible maybe in the next few weeks we will do that. We'll have to wait and see. But so far, what Bitcoin is doing is unlike its previous bull market rally. And you could argue quite persuasively that what's happening in Bitcoin right now is not usually what happens in a healthy bull market. It doesn't look like what happened in the previous bull market. And here's another thing, guys. Actually, what's happening in Bitcoin right now is this market looks too bullish. It looks extremely bullish and positive. And that could be a red flag. You may ask, well, if this is not a bull market, then what is it? All right, guys, let's go to reason number three. B waves or bear market rallies. The gentleman you see here is Robert Prechter. And Robert Prechter is one of the world's experts on what is called Elliott Wave Theory. You see guys, according to Elliott Wave Theory, what could be happening is what's called a B wave or a bear market rally. Before I go into that, let me first of all read this. Here's what Robert Prechter says in his book, The Elliott Wave Principle. He says, B waves are phonies. They are sucker plays, bull traps, speculators paradise, orgies of odd lotter mentality. Or oh, uh, of dumb dude, that is the best linguistic way to describe this orgies of odd lotter mentality <laughs> complacency or both they often are unconfirmed by other averages are rarely technically strong and are virtually always doomed to complete retracement by wave c if the analyst can easily say to himself there is something wrong with this market chances are it's a b wave so what is it oh what up cash bear you see guys what we're talking what about fuck? essentially is a Welcome, bear brother. market rally. So even if you don't follow Elliott Wave Theory, the fact is this principle of bear market rallies is known to most chartists. The last major uptrend in Bitcoin ended in 2017 with Wave 5, as you see right now. When Bitcoin topped at near 20,000 in 2017, it started a major crash, a major drop, that was potentially the A wave, okay? In other words, what we're potentially dealing with right now, the current rally could be a B wave rally. In other words, a bear market rally, which is very common in any bear market. Then once the B wave rally completes, then we'll potentially start the C wave retracement, the C wave move to make a new bottom, new bottom potentially below the lows of wave A, and then we'll start the new uptrend in Bitcoin. By the way, this is also quite important to appreciate. Sometimes the B wave can go as high as the previous high it made before it started the wave A. In other words, it's very possible for a B wave rally, for a bear market rally, to go back to its previous highs, the previous high Bitcoin made in 2017, near 20,000. So that is a wow. possibility we need to consider as well. Once the B wave completes, we'll move towards a C wave correction or C wave drop towards the previous <laughs> lows it made. And once that completes, then we'll start a new uptrend towards the 50,000 levels. 
Let me show you some examples. So here's Bitcoin in 2014 and 2015. Notice guys that in the previous bear market of Bitcoin, something like that actually happened. As you'll see here, we had a B wave rally. As you see here, after the major crash in Bitcoin that occurred from 2013, 2014, it had a major rally. Now, a lot of folks at the time thought, oh, this is probably the next major bull market in Bitcoin. Look, it's going above the 21 weekly average and it's rallying higher. Therefore, this could potentially be the next bull market, except it was Jesus. not a bear. This was only a bear market Bitcoin rally. Bitcoin doesn't want to stop though, that's the problem. Wave, the bear market rally finished. It then started the C wave lower and it actually bottomed out near the 200, just below the 200 levels. Here's the example on gold. Very similar situation on gold after it crashed in 20. So basically we could uh, go all the way back down to 6K or we could go to 20K, nobody knows. <laughs> this is why I don't really get TA from, uh, I don't really watch YouTube or watch other people's TA because it's usually just like, I don't know, you know? He has a good point with the B waves though. I mean, it, it makes sense from a bank, man. Like I said before, like, you gotta liquidate everyone out, buy it all up on a low price, and then sell it to them when it's higher. But, the, fuck, dude. 11K could be the low price. You have no idea. Yeah, always trade what's in front of you. Very true. But I fuck, like,. I get the, the macro perspective, like long-term growth and whatnot, but in order to like be a good trader, you have to look at the, the micro and be able just to enter a trade on a good micro level and then hold it for the macro. up another long there and those buys came in so ridiculous dude Yeah, I don't know if it's gonna happen here. Might just take this loss here, 200 bucks, not bad. Yeah, there we go. <coughs> Close out your swing. Oh yeah, dude. How much you make? Woo! 850%. Good fucking job, bro. Add a baby.
Yo, what up, Back Valungua and Cash Bear and Electric Longboard? How you guys doing? Lux. Yeah, consistency is key, man. Don't give a shit about anything else. All that matters is consistency and percentages. As long as you get those two down, then you'll be a millionaire by the end of your life. Damn it, I should have held that long. It was a good one. I got shook out. <laughs> they wrecked me, boys. I lost $200. Noticed that it also formed a B wave rally, which many people thought, oh, you know what, this is the next bull market. It's going to go up to, you know, 5,000, 10,000 on gold. It didn't do that. It crashed and. Oh, yeah, Obi Wan, thanks for hanging out, bro. It's good to talk about this shit with somebody. You have a good sleep, though, alright, brother? I'll see you later. Stop by. Don't forget, we got that, uh, we got that giveaway on the 6th of the next month. Gonna collect your Amazon gift cards. Good lord. That, that was a definitely a good buy, but I just didn't hold it. Night, man. Take it easy, brother. See you later. Ball Python husbandry is the pair that I am most confident about. I've kept them the longest, I've gone through the most issues, I've had the most success, and I've done the most research on them. Been like this though, it was four, four years ago, yeah, four years ago is when I first started and got Sunny here. He was very young. I did a video on him like the day after I got him. I think it's still on the channel. But today I thought I would talk about my uncle. So back in the right year of 2013, December 2013 to be exact, my early Christmas gift was my very first snake. snake was something I wanted for quite a little while, and I did lots of research on which species I wanted. I finally decided I wanted a corn snake, and there's a reptile expo coming up, and it's the one we decided to go to, I was gonna go there. So I mean, hey, at least we're starting off on a good place, we didn't go to Petco to get it, and I walked around the area. I found lots of booths with different corn snakes, because obviously they're like everywhere, um, and I sort of almost decided on one, there were a couple that were pretty cool, but then I wandered on over to the ball python area and there were lots of sellers. Uh, there was one pet store, I won't say the names of any of them, but there was a pet store set up there, and Sunny was one of the animals there. They had a ton of ball pythons, they all looked quite healthy. Uh, however, I didn't know anything about ball pythons. I went there for a corn snake, and I think my mom didn't want me to get anything with python in the name because it sounded too big and scary. But we talked to the people there, they said, oh yeah, they just get like four to five feet, I can't remember exactly what they said and they gave all of this general information. That was one of my first issues. I just assumed that everything they said, since they're the sellers, is the word that I can take. 
why would I question it? They sell ball pythons. Now it's possible that you know. It's best to ask lots of people and use lots of resources. Some like Reptabar, two lamps, a day light and a night light. Uh, did not come with a heat mat. I got a little. equipment with vehicles and work privileges are at your disposal. It's one of these games that'll never get released. Find a suitable job. Make private contracts with other players. Or execute high risk state contracts. When it comes to power, there is no one more powerful than a mayor. And each player has a chance to become one. Expand and improve infrastructure. Provide electricity, food ports, hospitals, police stations. Find new towns in other parts of the island, and bring in more other players' needs. Or things just need to be crisp. Hire other players to form a dedicated team, and the sky is going to be the limit. In case you're not interested in government affairs, you can try yourself in business. Start your own production by opening a phone to Build a ready warehouse to store goods. Everything that could be right, mine, or captured. Trade through the land for other players' stores. Trade demand and deliver goods to car dealerships, gas stations, food shops, and other third-party marketplaces. Find a oil source, start fuel production, and open up private gas stations. And don't worry about the land. There's plenty of space for everyone. Thank you. 
Probably, we'll probably hear about another GTA in like two years, and then three years we'll probably have another one. <coughs> no, I'm pretty sure we'll have the longest gap between GTA games. I'm not sure how many of you guys know this, but for about nine years I worked and for part of that time I managed a local PetSmart store. I was in their pet care department and I used to be their pet care manager, so I made sure that the animals were all properly taken care of, especially the birds and the reptiles. Because of all of my years there, they kind of labeled me as the bird nerd and the reptile person, so whenever they have some reptile questions that they're stumped on, they usually come to me. And the reason why I mention this is because today I picked up an adorable little ball python. And this snake was brought into the store about six to eight weeks ago and it has not eaten for them. And just recently it's starting to act a little wobbly, kind of weak, and starting to lose some weight. Unfortunately, PetSmart policy does not allow live rodent feeding to the reptiles, which is what they would have liked to have tried. So thankfully, before waiting until it was too late for this snake, they instead decided to adopt it out to me so that I could hopefully get it eating and get it back on the right track, which I think is good on PetSmart's part. It was a good decision because this snake is starting to look a little bit thin. It's not too bad, but again, they were proactive and they adopted it out before it became too thin. Now you can see the top comes to a point. If you look up here, the snake isn't round like it should be, but that, and that tells us that it's a little bit underweight. I can also feel the vertebrae as I run my thumb down its spine. But again, it's not terribly bad, and it's a cute little snake. Although I'm not a huge fan of where PetSmart acquires the reptiles from, 
I do love the fact that most PetSmart locations anyway truly do put the animals first and they will do whatever is necessary to make sure that animal is taken care of. Again, I can't attest this to all locations, but at least the store that I work for really does care about their animals. So the plan is to probably end up feeding this snake live, but I kind of want to see if I can get it to eat frozen thawed first. There's a possibility that it was just too stressful in an, of an environment or something was off in its environment that was causing it not to eat. Here's the small enclosure I have set up for this little guy or gal. The reason why it's a little smaller than I'd recommend for a ball python is because first, this is quarantine. Second, smaller enclosures sometimes make stressed out snakes eat better. So I'm going to give this a shot. I have a cave on the warm and the cool end, water dish of course, and a humidity box. We'll see if that helps too. Okay, little girl. I think you're a girl. Check it out, calm down, and then we'll try to feed you. Okay, are you ready for this? It is nighttime, as you can see, and this should have given her plenty of time to calm down. And tip number two, by the way, to getting picky snakes to eat, since tip number one is to use a smaller than normal enclosure. Tip number two is to feed nocturnal species at night and diurnal species during the day because that's when they're naturally active and searching for food. Tip number three is to make sure that the mouse is warm, especially with nocturnal species. These species, like ball pythons, have heat sensing pit organs along their upper and sometimes other pythons have them along their lower lips. And these pits allow them to see the heat of their prey items. So what many people will do is they'll take their frozen mouse and leave it in the hot water too long and that water will become cool and the mouse will cool down along with it. And if the snake doesn't see the heat of the animal using their pit organs, they're not gonna recognize it as food. So we're going to see if, oh, good night fish. We're going to see if we can get her to eat on day one using all three of these techniques. Here we go. Where is she? I think she's in that cave. So let's, hmm, I don't want to stress her out too much, but we're going to try this. Okay, yep, there she is. Hi, cutie. Mouse, meat, snake. Oh, wow, awesome. Day one. Okay, I actually was not expecting that tonight. That's fantastic. Uh, I don't want you to lay it in the bedding. Okay, we are laying her in here so that she does not get a bunch of bedding stuck to it. But look at that. I guess she just needed a different environment, maybe a different technique for feeding helped out, but she's eating for me. This is fantastic. These three techniques, by the way, can be used for snakes that are currently being fed live and are being stubborn in the transition to frozen thawed. The new manager did seem to know what she was doing. She was trying to scent the mice there with African soft fur juice, which I have yet to determine whether juice is just old bath water from African soft furs or if it's something else. I kind of don't want to know. Regardless, it seemed like she knew she, what she was talking about, but nothing was working at the store. So my guess is maybe the store environment was just too stressful for the snake and she needed somewhere calmer to feel secure enough to eat. Maybe the mouse was the wrong temperature or they were feeding at the wrong time of day. It's hard to tell, but the important thing is that she's eating right now, which I still can't believe. Ball pythons are native to Africa where they spend a decent amount of their time in hot, humid termite mounds. Now, they don't spend all of their time in these mounds, which is why you shouldn't have a permanently humid environment for them, or they can develop things like scale rot. Instead, I recommend giving them an environment with dry aspen for substrate and a humid retreat or a humidity box. That humidity box will act as a termite mound and they will go in and out of it as they need to to rehydrate themselves. I also recommend having a cave on the warm end of the enclosure and that way they can stay hidden whether they want to be in a humid environment or a drier environment. I won't be keeping this ball python forever. I just took her in temporarily to get her back to a healthy weight and then I'll find her a new forever home or since I'll have her anyway, maybe I'll do a ball python care video finally. In case you're wondering, she will be up for adoption once she's a healthy weight, but please do not comment with your address below. That's just not a good idea. If you are interested in her, just keep an eye on the website under the available reptiles tab. And once she is ready for adoption, I'll post her on there and we'll find her her forever home. Thanks for watching this adorable ball python eat. 
Don't forget to vote for next week's Feed My Pet Friday in the top right corner, and we'll see you next week. If you are into reptiles right now or thinking about getting into them in the future, male, we have a large female as well, but she's rather old and doesn't seem to show any signs of wanting to breed. So we ended up getting a new female finally. We found a female for his future girlfriend, and I'll be showing her to you later on in the video. The first tool that we recommend that every snake owner has on hand would be a snake hook. Now, even if your snake is friendly at home, you never know if they're like in feeding mode or if they're having an off day and you need to move them from one place to the other, but they're acting a little defensively, a snake hook comes in handy. Snake hooks allow you to move your snake from point A to point B in a manner that is safe for you, both you and the snake if they're acting a little bit defensively. Mine here doesn't need a hook, I trust this guy, but you can at least see kind of how it's used without, you know, letting their mouth actually get close to your hand. Snake hooks also come in handy when your snake is uh, ready for food and they might strike out at you if you got a little too close. So you can either use your hook to open up their bin if you use a rack system, or you can take the hook and gently tap them on the side to let them know that you're not food and you're there to handle them. And a lot of snakes will start to make the connection of being tapped with gently with a snake hook and being handled shortly afterwards. And that kind of gets them out of food mode. It also doubles as a back scratcher, which is really handy. This is a medium-sized snake hook. It's good for most species of snakes that are commonly kept as pets. It's a good universal size of snake hook to use. But if you have a smaller species of snake and you need something not quite this big, there's actually all sorts of different sizes and styles of snake hooks, including telescoping ones that are available on the market. And all these products that we'll be mentioning today, by the way, I'll put links to in the description below in case you want to know where to get them. Now on the opposite end, there are bigger hooks as well. We have a pretty big hook that we use for our berms and retics, and there's even larger hooks than these available. The second tool we recommend are feeding tongs. I think everyone should have these on hand if you own a snake. A lot of people will dangle the rodent by its tail when feeding their snake, but that kind of risks your hand getting bit. So in order to avoid that risk altogether, just feed using your feeding tongs. They last forever. They're like $10, so it's well worth the investment. Just like snake hooks, the feeding tongues come in different sizes too. This is the most often used size for most species of snakes, anything from small corn snakes to adult ball pythons. But when you get into bigger snakes, like boa constrictors and Burmese pythons, reticulated pythons, things like that, then we recommend a more industrial sized snake feeding tongs, or this is a feeding gripper, I guess you could call it. I don't know, what, what was it called when you got it? Not sure? We're gonna go with feeding tongs, I think. That makes the most sense for these. Anyway, they have a handle which closes the tongs at the end so you can keep yourself at a little bit further of a distance from a larger species of snake. And these give a really good grip on the rat's tail so you don't have to worry about it slipping through the tongs like they sometimes do with the smaller version. Next on the list is a good thermometer. There's pet stores that sell the small circular like dial style thermometers that stick on the back of the tank. Those are not only not very accurate, but they also measure the temperature of wherever they're stuck to. And you want to read the temperature of where the snake's going to be at, which is on the bedding itself. So unless you want to put your dial thermometer underneath a hide and then pull it out to check the temp occasionally, it's just not worth the effort. So instead, I recommend getting a digital thermometer like a temp gun here. Temp guns are so useful when you own snakes because you can take this with you from one room to the next. The laser shows you where it's reading its temperature at and there's a nice LED screen to tell you exactly what temperature it's reading. And this will allow you to check the temperature of the warm end, the cool end on top of the cave, inside of the cave, or you can use it to check bath water temps. So this really comes in handy and I highly recommend that every snake owner has a temp gun. They're like $15, but totally worth it. The next product we recommend everyone have is a good cleaning solution. Where there's things that you can use like bleach and vinegar water, and we use those for certain tasks, but our go-to cleaner 
is chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is safe for all pets. This is actually what veterinarians use in their offices and in their lab rooms to disinfect their tables and any tools they use with that get in contact with other animals. It's also non-irritating to reptiles and it's completely safe for them too. This is a very concentrated bottle of chlorhexidine. So this has to be diluted with water. Now you'll only need about 30 mils per gallon. So if you imagine, that's like two tablespoons of this per gallon of water that you dilute it with. So this bottle will last forever. And I usually dilute this and put it in a spray bottle like this. I actually bought this just for the spray bottle portion and I actually just fill it up with diluted chlorhexidine. And this is my cleaner in my snake room. Number five on the list applies to only people who are breeding snakes. This is a five mil syringe and the important thing at the end is the 16 gauge feeding needle. This is actually sold for squirrels, like with rehabilitating wild squirrels, baby squirrels. The feeding needle here is actually hollow and there's a rounded tip to it, so it's not a sharp, it's not actually a needle. But basically where you use this is when you're breeding a snake and your female snake gets egg bound, which you run that risk every time you breed a snake, you can t fill this syringe up with mineral oil and then insert the feeding needle into the cloaca of the snake and push in a little bit of the mineral oil to help lubricate that area to help her push the eggs out. This isn't to say that it'll happen every time, but it's nice to have this on hand in case it does. And for that matter, number six on our list would be mineral oil for the syringe. You can find... What's up, YouTube? This is Daniel Carter at Afro Herp Keeper. Uh, like in part to preserve the biodiversity of our remarkable My name is Daniel Carter and you're watching Ed. Get those off. We'll have to be extremely delicate with that because we don't want to damage her eyes as they are still under there. In addition to that, you can see that she has skin problems and the most obvious and apparent affliction is the rat bites all the way down from her head to the tip of her tail. So if you feed your snake live prey, which in itself is fine, um, you should know that it comes with risks, and you should absolutely never, ever, ever leave a capable prey item like a rodent with extremely sharp gnawing teeth. And I am going to do just a little bit of her treatment for you guys to see. I should say that the people I picked this girl up from are not the people who uh, left her in this condition. They got her from a coworker who clearly has no business taking care of animals. It is that person's neglect and lack of um, confidence in caring for this animal that has led to this advance. It's at her own hide, and she has about a fifth of an inch of this dry, powdery dirt. It's her substrate. You can tell there's coconut corn in there. I can't tell what else is in there. But it definitely looks like it's never been replaced. And that totally dry, powdery substrate probably holds absolutely no humidity. And uh, humidity is certainly necessary for these guys to have proper sheds. I could not say when the last time she had a full shed was. Um, you can see that her skin is badly and wrinkly. These are all, it looks like something other than tea. Um, and it is also safe for the drink, which is good because this soap has two purposes. Uh, one, the general antiseptic is good for cleaning her wounds and making sure the infection doesn't set in. Two, she does need to be rehydrated. So at least not the freshest pictures of her that she has had some time. We should be playing as well. So we're going to let her sit in this for about 15 minutes. And then we'll come back. Looks like once she's properly hydrated, all of this dirt and stuff is off the board. as long as we can get this layer or two of unshed skin off. Something. So while she is in there, 
we were gonna dump all this crap out of here. And uh, I'm not dumping this outside because it is uh, <laughs> potentially a fire hazard. We were gonna dump this in a trash bag. Most of the substrate is gone. We are spraying this down with F10SC veterinary disinfectant. It's uh, about the safest and most effective cage cleaner, surface cleaner you can buy. It's perfectly safe for pretty much any vertebrate. I think for invertebrates as well. I use it for everything. And then once that's got a nice coat, we're going to let it sit for a minute, and then we are going to wipe it down. Because this is a quarantine setup, we're going really basic on the substrate. We are just going to use some paper towels. They get the job done, and they're very easy to replace anytime they get soiled. Simple, cheap, effective, not something I would use long term, but for a sick animal, uh, it's better to go simple and easy to clean. I collect used hides and equipment uh, just for this purpose, in case I have a new face or two or three. So I've picked out a few things and we're going to give them the same treatment we gave the cage. Just spray them all down with this veterinary disinfectant. Uh, for these, we're just going to let it dry and then we're going to stick them in there. this up so I can get him out of his kinky water. For his water dish, we are also going super simple, just a Hyrex Tupperware container. Um, it's big enough to fit him inside. Okay, while the uh, hide boxes are drying, you can probably see some of the interesting head to all the problems that spider ball head that's having his exhibit. So, before you get all the food, out of here. And so uh, this is what spider ball pythons do. This is not part of his neglect. It's probably emphasized because of his neglect, but this morph actually has inherent neurological issues. So let's wrap this up so I can stop by. It's pretty severe. So on top of everything else, it looks like this guy has a very pronounced um, head wobble. kind of hard to watch. So we're going to place him in here so that he can stop picking up. So this is interesting. Not quite what I expected to see. Um, I'm not sure if this is attributable to the spider morph or if this is indicative of a more severe neurological issue. So I'm going to be looking into that on top of everything else that he has going on. He did have a bowel movement. Said that's an excellent first step towards recovery. Um, what we're going to be doing now, this is the second part of his treatment regimen. We're going to be doing both the soap and this every 48 hours. But what we're doing now is applying this Silvadine, silver sulfadiazine cream, uh, to all of his bite marks. So basically, all the way down his spine. This is a topical antibiotic disinfectant. Um, made by Ascend Laboratories, LLC. We're just going to take a dab of this at a time and uh, brush it on his back, uh, starting with probably the worst looking spots. And we're really going to go to town on this because we want it disappearing sooner rather than later. He's got to be very confused and concerned. He's had a long day, but uh, hopefully this is his first step towards true recovery. Make sure to really get in there anywhere it's still exposed and red. And he has this all the way down his back. Really sad. 
even the, the tip of his tail is uh, looking pretty gnawed on. It's been very good for me. I don't know what the uh, freak out was about a minute ago. It's a little concerning, so I will be looking into that. You can really see the uh, mouth right there. Thankfully, it looks like the rat stayed away from his face. Could have been a lot worse, even though it's pretty bad to begin with. He is starting to object to this. That's for sure. Okay, his head is soaked. He had a bowel movement. He is now coated in antibiotic. Time to add all of his components in here. And uh, for heat, he is going to have a medium zoom ed heat pad on a thermostat. So here it is, incredibly simple setup, but hopefully enough going on to keep him at least somewhat entertained. This heat pad is going to be under this hide um, on this side so that he has the option to be either directly on top of it or next to it, but still feeling the heat. It is going to be plugged into a thermostat to ensure that he doesn't get fried. On top of all of his other issues, we don't want him getting cooked. Um, and then on this side, he has these two smaller hides, which realistically won't fit him entirely, but they're what I had, and that'll give him something to explore. This is going to be his water dish. I might get a bigger one. It's going to go right here for now, so that he has access to water. So thank you all very much for watching. Um, I hope you learned a thing or two. So we're back with another feeding video. This is the rabbit, or kind of beef rabbit. I've been doing this for keeping an eye on the girl too. So you know, she's going crazy. I'm going to keep an eye on this one. Oh my god. She's stretched out from that far. See? That shows me right there, she can reach me if I decide to put my hand in there. So, you guys can kind of... my girl here, she's with this stretch, the baby stretch going on. Yeah. This is something else that I can tell she was not good. No, 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 no. She's not cold. She just shed too long ago. She just put some inside of her.
You notice how they stop rattling when they're in the feeding mode. They don't make any noise. Before the strike, they don't rattle, so they don't make any noise, basically. They don't get hurt at the time. Definitely feeling better now. Hey, what's up guys, it's Daryl Farm here, we're back with another video, and here we're going to be feeding from another new acquisition too. This is going to be feeding a uh, super small hopper, big fuzzy, and we're feeding a new West Valley girl, she's a baby. And she's ready to come out and eat, look at her. Diamondbacks, boys and girls. And dad's on again. <laughs> the reason why I got. Any guys watch my videos? I'm okay. eating one of my other new act. Obviously, she's hiding in her eye. Okay. We got some more changes to take out, as you guys can see. <laughs> so, let's see here. What do we feed you to? Hey, get, get down. What you doing? Crazy? Who told you to jump like that, huh? I just need one more stair. Hey, what's up guys, it's Dead Wolf Farm here, we're back with another video, and I got some new stuff, and as you guys can see here, this is going to be free, take that right there. Alright, let's see what we got here, and we'll go ahead and put this guy in here. Remember, they go off heat sense, so they use 
you see, he probably doesn't even notice it yet. Uh, give it some time. I just pooped right there earlier. Okay, he's done. He's done. Boom, there you go. Oh, he, he should have got him. That was close. Close call, man. No one else. Get out of there. Get out of there. Great, come on inside the hide. That's fun. Uh, you guys can see there, the mouse decided to go hide in the hide, so that's gonna be fun. Oh, there he goes. So disappointing. Interesting. I don't want to eat in front of me. What the? Wow. Oh. There we go. That's what I'm talking about, boys and girls. Took a little time, but hey, we made it happen, guys. All right. Wow, he just came out and flipped out or something. I did some research on this guy just because I really don't care. But I did. He's not even a venomous keeper. He doesn't keep animals at all. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. That's what I was going to Anyway, another thing, guys, I want to make this very clear. I'm not Viper Keeper. Okay? I handle my animals the way I want to. So, for those out of you that keep comparing me to Viper Keeper, that's great. Al is an awesome guy. He's an amazing keeper. But I'm not out. Al's been doing this for a very long time. I respect Al very, very much. So, 
I handle my animals the way I do. And if you don't like it, you don't have to watch. But for those of you that do watch and do like it, I appreciate it. I do see your guys' comments. I'm sorry I don't always answer back. Um, I do my best. But today is an awesome day. Chandler is still out of town. And I need to feed Kevin. It's been a little while since Kevin ate. Um, I do have a snake for him defrosting currently right now. He is beyond ready. I know he is. So, we're going to start feeding him. It is again. But super excited. Again, the head is missing. Get over it. So, right there. And, uh, yeah, the other hand to uh, feed Kevin. So, this should be very interesting. I have to grab my handy dandy. Um, but yeah, this is definitely going to be interesting, so sorry if I do get crappy footage, guys, but I'm going to do my best to get good footage, so here we go. Oh, Mr. Kevin, Mr. Kevin, you hungry, Mr. Kevin? Tapped them into next Tuesday. I saved us all from a triple C4. No one cares because it's casual. <laughs> Please. Somebody say it was cool. That was one of the best shots I've ever seen, Marley. There we go. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I was like, fuck you, I'm not Oh, oh my god. Are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, good job, bro. <laughs> Watch this launch, mate. Stand there, stand there, and don't move. I'm gonna, my Twitch show is gonna land on you. <laughs> is it fuck, man? This is the Yeet Olympics, man. Yoi! Oh, no! <laughs> this guy's just sitting there watching. It's the Yeet Olympics, man. man. Uh, Dr. Hawkeye, can you, can you throw a drone into the air? Holy! Oh! Uh, <laughs> I got you, buddy. 2v5, mate, we can do it. Oh, I said just surely. <laughs> yep. Three. Um, excuse me, what the? Oh! Oh! oh. oh. No way! Drop shot, baby! Oh Let's go! My. Oh my god, dude. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I saw his kill, I saw his kill. 1v4. On, Where is he, my friend? Again. I will ace with revolver. Yes? It's actually disgusting how you do that, mate. Actually, it's a good kill. Did you get him again? Fuck off, mate. It's actually making me feel ill. What do you mean, mate? <laughs> 1v4 to like, 1v1 in the space of two seconds there. Oh, well, we got one bullet in a dream in that secondary weapon, mate. Do we actually oh my god, Charlie, I do, mate. It's been set one up bullet. so nicely, mate. That was a natural one bullet as so well. I didn't have to force that one. I can't say no to that. I hear him. I smell him. <laughs> Lol. Cloud teacher, mate. They're not recovering from that. You are tracking me. <laughs> I watched that glued onto my... <laughs> yeah, no, no. Pushing you, pushing you. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> right, Castle, all you gotta say is watch this kill. Oh my <laughs> Oh my god, that was a fucking lot of shots that took. Definitely not clipping that. <laughs> He's clip What was that? You literally point blank skull fuck. Oh that just aced through that wall. <laughs> Me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you aim you aced through the fucking wall. <laughs> Sometimes Marley, I don't know whether we're angry or impressed. <laughs> Usually both. Princess. Ah! Where have you gone? Still there. I got him. Oh my god. No way. <laughs> no way. Is he flying? <laughs> Is he flying? No. Whoa. What the? <laughs> I'm actually shaking with anger. I've never been more disappointed in myself than that. that that's a new one. <laughs> <idea. laughs> it was diamond to copper in about four seconds, but John, do you know the good thing about knock? Her what? primary is the FMG9, which I already have black eyes for. Imagine only having one primary black eyes. Imagine. Imagine how sad that'd be, especially at level like, what level are you? Like two or something? Imagine how many alpha packs you've opened and never got. I can't imagine. I honestly, mate, if it was me, I would have got, got refund on this game by now. That would just make me this. Save. All those other packs. Yo, yeah, anybody got a reinforcement? You got a reinforcement? Yeah? Can you put it right there? Yeah, reinforce that. My guy! Thank you. Dom! Oh, I'm sorry, mate. Um, He's been buried in barbed wire, mate. And the battery. There you go, let's sort it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! That's the only reason I did it. I was going to get back. Look at this fuse. What, what the hell the is he doing? Whoa! Oh my god! No, no. Right, Dom, stop team killing. Hey. Oh, oh my god! What the hell is happening? No, 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 Dom. you are. <laughs> Thank you, mate. Thank you so much. Sorry, mate. Good luck. I really wish you the best. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I forgot! What the fuck? <laughs> ah, I tried to hit you as well, that's the worst part, I was actually trying to hit you. And you like dodged out of the way of it. And you zapped yourself and then drove oh, into like, an electrified yeah. wall. Push into the objective, we are making progress. Oh, what the? No! <laughs> you just got fucking bopped on me. No, <laughs> mate, relax, Tom. It doesn't need to be like this, Tom. Ah! <laughs> I'm sad. One tap, let's go. Yeah? Yeah. Oh my! Oh! Who's me? Oh! oh well, you got all on that. He was so <laughs> clueless. No, no. Leave me alone. Oh. I might fuck about an ace with this pistol. I'm kind of in the in the mood for it, you know. Come next side, mate. Oh, you have one round. Oh my lord. Right. Oh. 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 If you win, you can save the game. <laughs> he's right in front of you. He's right in front of you. I'm joking. Oh. Wait, he's, he's about to be. He's, he's about dumb, to be. He's, he's actually coming. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. <laughs> please tab in. Please tab in. Fusion. Fusion. Fusion, please. He's right there. <laughs> oh, he's oh, left. Left, 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 Please, you're literally move good. Up, 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 wait. Move. Oh my god, he's running. Go, oh, great. Oh my god, what the oh fuck is god. going on? <laughs> Dude, my game would not let me tab in. 
What? What? Hello? Wait, what? Mate. Did you see him stuck in place? What? Yeah. Oh, what? I can't play, I can't play, I can't play. I have, no, one, bullet in this, I have one bullet in this gun. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Mate! That was oh, sick! I think you just jump out so you can into it. How are you just how, oh, how are you oh. dodging this? How? Oh. No way, you dodge this again. Oh, oh. No way, you dodge that. I'm going back out. I'm going back out. I'm not done. I'm oh, usually pretty good. Cool. Ah, come again. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. This come is again. chaos. Come again. What? I don't know what. No. Oh, no, mate, we're not even done. I'm going to get the last kill as well, and you are going to be absolutely human. If you get the last kill, mate, I'm from a keyboard out of the window. Yeah? Oh! No, <laughs> Don't think they're dead. I've just broke it. I've actually just broken it. I've actually just broken it. There's, there's a key missing. Where is it gone? What key is it, mate? Is it the you, you love to see it button? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> oh, mate, the same. Oh, the bait. Look at the bait! The bait! What? What? No, Dom! I... Dom, what? Dom! <laughs> Dom! Please, Dom! <laughs> what was I need that? A second. Then? I need a second just to breathe. At least you're doing that kind of cleaning up in the laundry. That is the worst joke I've ever heard. <laughs> what did That's he say? A... What did he say? He said, at least you're doing that kind of cleaning up in the laundry room. Oh, <laughs> custard! Just trying to boost your fucking video from 10 views to 1,000. You know what I'm saying? Hold on, hold on. <clears throat> yeah. What? 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 Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Ah! Oh my oh, god! What was that? <laughs> What did we just do to these guys? Like, what did you just do? I don't even know, mate. But I'm glad I did it. What's up? Oh no my way! God. No way! What the fuck? What? <laughs> what? 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 Mate, <laughs> you threw a fucking bone cover black <laughs> face noggin. What do you mean? Right, I need to breathe, mate. Do I get this ace or do I not? That is the question. Yeah, cap on set. What the fuck? Oh, cap on set. Oh. <laughs> what the fuck is going on, mate? I cannot explain what I just. Oh, no. yeah, boy. No way. Easy no fucking around, way, man. No That's ridiculous. <laughs> Why is that ridiculous, mate? That was completely what calculated, you... calm, and controlled, mate. Calculated. Play. I just went for a gentle roast toast package up and. Toast, baby. I heard a rumor that uh, there's a shotgun meta going around. Uh, just get on there. Full map of judge. Casted. How's that shotgun meta? <laughs> what? <laughs> shotgun <laughs> meta. So fucking one meter away from a shotgun. He should be sucking down pellets in a fucking gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> shotgun meta. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell. Thank you. 
My first legendary. Yeah. What is it? What is it? Uh, I only got. I'm opening I got up. Come on. Okay. okay I need some Jaeger. No, no, no. Let's see. Oh, I think they're about to throw us. <laughs> That grenade was on the other side of the thing! Oh my gosh! No way, guys! No way! No way! Wait, 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 wait! Oh my god, I just flashed myself twice in a row. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, Matt, you're an absolute madman. Let's see if we can get in there. Oh Someone shit, did you see? That was, that was so s scary as shit, man! I just got waved at. Are you kidding me? Jump out, bully. That window. Is there a claymore? Second, uh, no. Use ass and cappy towel. Sure. There's three of them over there. No claymore, no claymore. So jump out. Jump out. 
You have entered enemy control. Fucking Claymore, bro. Friendly operator. Do you need some? Cool. Ten seconds before. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> Stream content right here, Dan. What the fuck? What the fuck? What? What the <laughs> fuck happened to your drone then? <laughs> it like shot 70 foot into the air, didn't it? It did, what the fuck? Play on either the uh, service. What the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> 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 Sit the fuck down.
should I do with them? Should I let them win? No, just end it. And noob number one, and noob number two. You missed, boy. <laughs> More than five times. Oh my god! <laughs> Nothing, we don't like you. What up, Eric? <laughs> hey, have you ever seen uh, Kate's pictures, Ladyboy? Hold on. Fucking Sip6 is going wild right now. What'd you say? <laughs> I was talking to Ladyboy. Oh. Have you ever seen Kate's photos? Of what? His, like, his outfit, like his black outfit, dude. No. <laughs> He's just the He's the fucking Punisher. Bro, dude, I, I'm gonna show you this real quick. Don't tell anyone I showed this to you. He looks like, like... <laughs> it looks like, like a Strangle Scans, dude. A Nazi. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> oh, wait, I thought I have seen that before. I think you have. He, he just... said he strangles people at night. Well, if you haven't seen it, this is gonna confirm your <laughs> beliefs. <laughs> that's like, that's what Cade looks like. He's a cool guy, but he's fucking... He looks like a molester guy, I used to know. <laughs> it looks like he, he uh, captures women and sells them to for a very nice price. For a very low price. <laughs> Dri drives them down south to Mexico to the cartels. Oh, uh, Jesus. That shit's hilarious, dude. Yeah. <laughs> His voice doesn't match his look, though. Fuck, no, it doesn't. I thought he was gonna be some skinny, nerdy guy. Nope, like he's you. the Nazi from... <laughs> from Indiana Jones, bro! That's what that, that's what I was thinking! <laughs> hey, you know the big... I think it's, uh... Resident Evil 2. Where, it's like, it's just a big guy in that ex exact same outfit that just stomps and follows you around. <laughs> I'll find a picture. Hold on, hold on. I wonder if he's hitting I, I, I sent this to Cade. I want to get to check Cade's chat. Wait, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> wait, wait for I sent it. it. <laughs> Kyle, look.
Hold on. <laughs> we really like this picture. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Uh, I'm like Kyle, dying here and I need to do This is the uh Kyle, I just sent you the picture. It's uh That's the Resident Evil character I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. Hold on a second. Oh. What does this guy do? Oh, a dizzy look. <laughs> Hold on. I'm making a a choice right now. <laughs> Yeah, I know that's I know that's what he looks like. And he's in college. No way. Yeah. Hey, he's, he's taking classes. What? No. <laughs> Do you think he's a dumbass or something? He looks like he's 40. I think he's 30 something. Huh, I was just saying, he, he doesn't look like he's in college. He was fucked up like. I forgot what the sickness is called, but he had like a disability. Dumb. Like, put him in the hospital. No, like. <laughs> medical. That's fucked, bro. That's fucked. I know, something's wrong with me. Tyler agrees. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, he sent the fucking. Indiana Jones. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is a character in, uh, like a big giant character in, uh, Resident Evil. Where's the fucking. Ooh, there's a carcass on the road. Grants a free builder. All builders have one extra improvement. Must be built on desert. Well, I have that. Oh damn, they've really optimized this game now.
Alright, I gotta get off. Later. Later. <laughs> That's a funny picture, Disney. That's the uh, Resident Evil enemy.
can also probably tell that she is rather skinny. Uh, she has not yet eaten for me. I've tried twice with frozen fawn rodents. Because her diet with her previous owner was live rats, that's what I'm going to try next. It may be the only thing she'll take. Uh, obviously, because of her injuries, I will be supervising the feeding, and as I made clear in the last video on this girl, you should never, ever leave a live prey item uh, for any extended period of time unsupervised in your snake's tank, because they can cause damage with their teeth. So yeah, overall, Saturn is a beautiful little girl. Uh, I'm very, very proud of her progress. Uh, proud of myself for having gotten her this far, especially because of the attention she's gotten. Metal detecting is something I always wanted to do since I was a kid, and I finally bought like a real deal waterproof metal detector, and it's actually waterproof up to like I think 300 feet deep. But what's also really cool is that when I'm searching in a spot, I can potentially find a real deal like gold diamond ring that's worth a lot of money. And with three people out here searching, I honestly think we're gonna get super lucky and find something awesome. So before we get out there, and we're excited to team up with the guys, and there's no telling what we're gonna find today. So hopefully we get lucky. So today's gonna be my first time metal detecting. I even bought a metal the person who lost his ring i'll mail it out to him for free but this is awesome man found my first ring today and it's gold and it has a little diamond just like this and so I was like oh man one more big waft and then I go to pull it out and then I see that and I was like whoa I yelled underwater and turned her and you turned around you remember that dude I just want to let you know that you're killing it yeah you're doing a good job man and you know with that said you want to take things to the next level yeah oh my man. why don't y'all ever get anybody else <laughs> If you guys Hunter, uh, by any chance, did you lose a ring? Yes, I did. Oh, yeah? What's it look like? Oh, my God. Uh, I lost it in Hawaii. In Hawaii, when I was a big kid. Yeah, how many years? Texas and El Paso. El Paso, yeah? What, uh... I stuck my name inside and grave, Mohan, Logan Rodden. Yeah, man, it looks like I found your ring. Oh my God! Are you serious? Yeah. Are you snorkeling in the bay? I was, uh, I was actually metal detecting, and I uh, went around. And I found a few rings, but this was the only one with a name, and I've been saving on to it, trying to find you, and it looks like I found you today. Oh my God! <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I never expected. Oh my God! <laughs> oh my God! Really? Yeah, really, man. Oh my God! I want to give you something in return. No, no, no. I don't want anything in return, man. I'm just going to mail this out to you for free. And, you know, it's just what I like to do, man. I love treasure hunting, and I love reuniting people that have lost valuables. And it's so cool. I was able to find this ring, 
and figure out who it belonged to. Oh, no, man. Thank you so much, though. Seriously, thank you so much. I got somebody outside of break. Can I get some hidden meeting? I got I got one bowl. I hear him. Yeah, he's by the right side like I got one inside open. Pushing up, pushing up. He's going a bit wider now, he's going to the other van. Oh, that's good. Like he's gonna be big truck now. Crouch behind big back. truck. Yeah, yeah, he's speaking it. He's on drone, on drone, on drone. Main, 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 main. I got him. That was garage point? Yeah, yeah, that's main, main, main. <laughs> you main? Yeah, that's main, that's main. I got there. Let's go in server. Morning beepers. We can both push up if you want, both. Those beepers? That's him? That's a fuser. I'm gonna go for kitchen side. He's in kitchen, right side. There's no way you're not going, right? Yeah, but one was metal. That's metal. That's a good turn. Come on, officers. The bunk wall is soft because you want to try to nitro to make a rotate. I'm going to draw it. 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 I'm going to I got the draw it. I'm going to 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 draw it. I'm I got the nice. no man. Okay, I'm I'm falling off. I'm still trained. Like One by I'm, the I'm I'm the over front this shit. Middle door. He's just looking into the, the site. I'm watching down the office. Hallway. I'm watching office window. Yeah, don't go down that hallway. Yeah, don't don't go towards office, office window. window. Left like, side office. I I have I have the jump. He can now. Is he still being the That's window? the only one I see. Yeah, just one on the just, window. Just don't worry about the jump in. Don't expose yourself to the window because I have it. Wait, you can see the jump-in? I, I can see the jump-in office. Yeah, don't worry, worry about the train door. Yeah, yeah. I got the office window. In the window? In window. window. Tag. Okay, last time it's coming in the office side. Doesn't have bomb, doesn't have bomb. You're good. Yeah. First floor garage side. I uh, hit the door frame. <laughs> hey, get out of here. <laughs> I have the fuser front door. Is, that, is the last guy up top? Yes. Yeah, he was like second floor. Look at the chief. One's that car. Bro, what? We got one car. One's left stairs. Left stairs. Pushing white, pushing white. I got the guy white. So behind car, so behind car. My back got blown out. I got blown out, is that what you just said? Open the mirror. Burning out more. The mirror where. Like, like uh, on, on trophy. Yeah, trophy man. Ash is inside of office. Yo, run out. Ah, nothing. Fuck that. Okay, well, was that Ash's the big garage office? guy? Yeah, yeah, that was the big I got a twitch. Oh, why is this a crouch mirror? Uh, because there was a uh, 
claw. Is that ash? Yeah, that's an ash in the capital. What? Pushing through, pushing through. I downed him. Finish him off. Okay, yeah, no, 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 I'm not gonna finish him off. Another one dropped, another one dropped. Probably skylight last. Yeah, I can't believe I downed with a bubble. Very nice. <laughs> well, we still have smokes. Here, Habani, you're gonna get the diffuser. You can smoke out this guy for a plan. You must recover the diffuser. Wait, let me get this guy. The is now secured. Hold on, we have 30 seconds. Come over here for smoke. I am, I know. I'm trying to nade them here. Wait, find them in the middle. middle. Yeah. They got me around. I'm watching bomb throw. Just spraying me. Hallway, hallway. Yeah, flanking, flanking me now. Yeah, push them back too. Yeah, one's coming yeah, flank one's right now. Flanking. Meeting. I'm watching right split. Just watch out the left. There's two. Right here. One's definitely right here. Right. One more. Yeah, he's coming down, down, just catch him, just catch him right now. Kitchen, kitchen, kitchen. One's on bottom. Oh, I'm crossing the left. He's probably on the stairs. Nice, nice, nice. Hold the hatch, hold the hatch. Sure. Dude, you're so good. Ridiculous, man. Okay, I got another call here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm calling, calling. I'm on you. Is he, uh, he's, uh, he's 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 no way. He got me through the smoke. Yo, I'm down. I might be safe. Nice. Hello everyone, this is Egan Solo, and in today's video we will take a look on a new way to counter teleporting hackers. This method was found by a guy called Swerve. The way it works is that you have to lay down in certain spots and when they try to teleport to you, they will club and fall under the map to death. And as always, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm going to die you. Because you can't get me here. I told you there's certain spots I can't get you. I'm going to clip. Eh? Hold you. <laughs> they clip they clip through the map and they fall. <laughs> I got him! I got him boys! I got him! I did it! Let's go! Wait. I'm doing it! Let's go, baby! Yes! <laughs> you got you got a prone next to certain things. Shout out to Swerve! Shout out to Swerve!
Open area was not oh clear, dude. God. Open area is not clear. So, it just sounds like he's right in here. What? Oh. What? 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 He's playing. He's playing. He might be going. Uh, It looks like Healthcare is going to drop by behind the bomb, and it does look like Ysera is getting pushed, and he might just be taken out soon. He does the- OH NO! He, th he did the bikini body! He did the bikini body! That was huge! And it was like Luna Metal as well goes just as big, picking up another kill for him. Ah. Oh my god, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> Sandwich? I'm gonna drop the hatch here. Uh, maybe. Baby. I literally that was... told you I that know. I was gonna I drop. Know. I know, I know. Like, I'm telling you, you have severe brain delay. <laughs> <laughs> like, hello? We have complete top floor control, sir. It is ours. <laughs> One guy replaying sandwich. I'm Situational awareness is boring. But you're a habit. I was just. Alright, I got the exit camera, okay? Don't worry about it. Oh, I traded! You traded. Good oh, shit, Jack. Two versus two now. Don't seem too dumpy as well, please. I mean, the guy standing in half the boat. Oh, face <laughs> time, baby. Stop trading, Scare. Uh, I got killed by Kaid behind the bomb in sight. Shot that was. Andy Dawson? 
Wait, but then if they DOS the servers, then the points. So. I'm confused. <laughs> so that Die. means we have a cheater, but they have a DDoS. What? crazy run outs or gotten aggressive although we're kind of just seeing an exception to that thomas gets knocked out he was already relatively low though so probably couldn't affect the outcome of that hyena able to trade a moment later but eclipse still in a great position by stairs to find doodle taking him down rogan oh, much bigger oh, advantage oh. hyena though keeps trading it back you can see he's up to the double kill now just over a minute left roger on par still to execute hyena's gonna get droned out of his position inside of admin but the jump out it's gonna be spotted vert gets the kill on pixel and now it's all on hyena however finds one pickup on the outside nearly gets a player by the window they're gonna stop planting to try and kill him but they lose the diffuser in the process hyena and ace he's got the hard ping onto the last player alive and he's already low too this should be easy for him let's see if he can get it done oh my god this there it is Hyena, it's an ace. First one of stage two goes to the man from 92, Dream Team. When the team can't do it, call in one man, and it's gonna. A very common question with beginner snake owners is what size of rodent should you be feeding to your snake? So today we'll be explaining to you what size we recommend feeding to your snakes at home. Generally, the rule of thumb is that you want to feed a rodent that is slightly larger than the thickest part of the snake's body. 